Welcome, everyone. <laughs> I'm Seth Jones, Senior Vice President and Director of the International S Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And I'm delighted to kick off today's uh, conference, which will be a full day discussion about a pressing topic, Homeland Cruise Missile Defense. When CSIS stood up its missile defense project in 2015, we did so with an eye toward deepening the discussion of air and missile defense. In the last seven years, the project has had tremendous success towards achieving that goal and to putting out high impact work. The team has published a significant number of articles, reports, has a vibrant microsite with an eye toward emerging issues that weren't, at least yet, on the broader policy radar. So I encourage you to look at the comprehensive portfolio of objective analysis by the CSIS missile defense team, uh, which includes not just ballistic missile defense, but the whole air and missile uh, defense threat spectrum to include uh, UAVs and countering UAVs, hypersonic defense, and then another part of that spectrum, uh, which is what we're going to focus on today, is, is uh, the cruise missile. Back when CSIS first announced its new project, we hosted a day-long conference. Uh, at that point, we had as keynote, then Vice Chairman uh, of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Sandy Winterfeld. So I went back and looked at that, uh, at that event and what, uh, uh, what uh, Winterfeld had to say, and as it turns out, it was interesting and very relevant for what we're going to talk about today. At that time, uh, which was 2015, the Russians had recently invaded and occupied Crimea. They were in the early stages of the war in eastern Ukraine, largely at that point uh, focused on leveraging Luhansk and Donetsk uh, militia organizations. But we were beginning to realize that, that uh, there was a new era of some kind that was upon us. At that conference, Admiral Winnefeld said that in his mind, homeland cruise missile defense had already risen in importance over that of regional ballistic missile defense, which, as folks here may recall, was a focus of the Obama administration. Sometimes it takes the Department of Defense a bit of time to mull over and move forward on some issues and, and problems, but I think as we've seen, the last two budget submissions seem to suggest that this issue is beginning to get some attention. Uh, today, you're going to hear a lot about the issue of cruise missile defense uh, and related issues from uh, individuals within the Department of Defense, as well as folks from industry and other subject matter experts. And we're going to think through uh, how to tackle this problem in a timely but also a cost-effective way. The Missile Defense uh, Project is also rolling out their new report on what Homeland Cruise Missile Defense might look like. Uh, I also want to thank, before uh, we begin, the Commander's Action Groups from uh, NORTHCOM, STRATCOM, and TRANSCOM for their cooperation leading up to today. And at, at uh, some point in the near future, we, uh, we will have a panel with uh, the combatant commanders uh, to discuss this issue. Let me also thank those who contributed to this study that is being released today, and thank, thank you to so many uh, for joining us in person, also online, to take part in this important discussion. Before we begin with our first esteemed panel, uh, which is moderated by Lee Hudson of Politico, I want to give the, f the floor first to Lieutenant General A.C. Roper, the Deputy Commander of NORTHCOM, for a brief video message. So over to Lieutenant General Roper. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to join you virtually today. On behalf of General Van Herc, the Commander of NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this discussion. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge the profound efforts of CSIS and their teams in not only bringing this event about, but in working through the research and publication of the Homeland Cruise Missile Defense Report. I am very encouraged by actions like this 
and by the individuals who have committed themselves to taking a hard look at our homeland defense challenges. Moving forward, alignment of our efforts will be crucial to success. Together, we must develop concepts to inform credible deterrence options focused on defending critical infrastructure that if degraded could bring us to our knees in times of crisis or conflict. You will have the opportunity to hear from different commands who share interests, equities, and are aligned, truly focused on generating globally integrated deterrence. To achieve globally integrated deterrence, we must understand that vulnerabilities to our homeland pose significant challenges to our respective missions. From our perspective at NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM, that mission includes topics such as continuity of government, nuclear command control communications, otherwise known as NC3, and preservation of power projection capabilities. The challenges to homeland defense and the world's current strategic environment are dynamic and ever-changing, different from the historic strategic context we have dealt with in the past. Recent actions by the PRC and the ongoing crisis in Ukraine are slowly waking people up to the reality of today's modern strategic environment and the potential threats to the homeland. Our strategic competitors, Russia and China, possess the capability and have demonstrated the intent to hold the homeland at risk, both kinetically and non-kinetically. As a result, we must deal with compressed decision space. As global tensions increase and competitor actions turn to aggression, the risk of strategic deterrence failure increases. That same global context highlights our limited domain awareness and outdated capabilities. It drives a sense of urgency to improve our posture to match or outpace our strategic competitors. This context begs the question, what do we need to do to move homeland defense forward? First, I want to underscore the fact that homeland defense or even continental defense does not start within the NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM area of responsibility. Homeland defense actually starts forward through the actions of the other combatant commands along with the support of our allies and partners. This approach uses all levers of influence, a truly whole of government perspective, and is executed globally across all domains, creating an integrated layered defense framework within which we execute homeland defense. Now, I want to state that we absolutely believe that nuclear deterrence is the foundation of homeland defense. However, we also must have credible deterrence options below the nuclear thresholds, options which allow for a balanced approach of deterrence by denial and deterrence by punishment or cost imposition. Those deterrence options aid in mitigating risk and help create doubt in adversaries' minds that they are able to achieve their objectives. One of the ways that we generate those credible deterrence options is through campaigning. Campaigning is a critical component of integrated deterrence. As detailed in the National Defense Strategy, it is focused on remaining in competition while avoiding crisis and conflict. The concept is built around credible demonstrations of will, capability, capacity, and resiliency, which are aimed at deterring adversaries, shaping their actions, and molding perceptions. All of our mutual operations, activities, exercises, and investments must be shaped by the idea of campaigning in day-to-day -day competition. The Arctic provides a clear case for campaigning in competition as we demonstrate mission readiness and operational capability in the high north. When messaged correctly, those activities provide a deterrent effect to competitors. The Arctic is an example of where we have made incredible progress, but also an area for future growth. And we have made significant progress in so many areas, ranging from the establishment of the Ted Stevens Center, our newest partner in Arctic advocacy, for a region of increased strategic competition to pending appropriations for over-the-horizon radars and the recent announcement by our Canadian partners committing to NORAD modernization. I am encouraged by this progress 
and by recent policy provided on what we must defend. Such policy will inform capability development and plans for limited area defense. Simply put, we cannot defend everything. Placing a Patriot or a THAAD battery on every street corner is both infeasible and unaffordable. However, we can focus on expanding domain awareness capabilities beyond OTHR and beyond sensor-to-shooter capabilities towards truly globally integrated solutions and sensor-to-decision-maker capabilities, which are aimed at increasing decision space and generating credible options. We can move past the focus on kinetic in-game defeat weapons and instead look towards resilience, redundancy, hardening, and strategic messaging to campaign. We can move faster towards JADC2-enabled decisions, which enable decisions at the speed of relevance. Thanks again for this opportunity, and I look forward to seeing the results generated by this event. Project and senior fellow at this at, here at CSIS at the International Security Program. Um, also joining me today are Colonel Matthew Strohmeyer, military fellow at CSIS, and Wes Rombaugh, the associate fellow with the Missile Defense Project at CSIS. Um, each of our panelists are going to give remarks, and then we'll have time for discussion. Okay. Well, thank you, Lee, uh, and thank you, uh, Seth, and also thanks to the Deputy Commander, uh, General Roper, for that uh, great introduction uh, and uh, that statement of support. You know, Seth quoted uh, Admiral Winnefeld's remarks back from 2015. It, it is kind of hard to realize it's been that long uh, when, we when we launched the project, and a recurring feature uh, of our work since has been an emphasis on, you know, the different aspects of air and missile defense besides just the legacy rogue state ballistic missile problem, and especially the need to redirect to the near peer. Today's report channels uh, some similar themes. Uh, it's been a big undertaking. I want to thank the whole missile defense uh, team, Ian Williams, Wes Rumbaugh, Sean Shake, and Masao Dahlgren, uh, as well as Lee said, uh, Colonel Matt Strohmeyer, uh, our Air Force uh, military fellow. But we've also benefited from a lot of, benefited from a lot of, uh, uh, of other folks, including our uh, co-author and advisory board member, Ken Harmon, who's here today. Uh, and a lot of other SME uh, and outside reviewers. Now let's begin by going back to Admiral Winnefeld's comments that Seth referenced, uh, where he said that Homeland Cruise Missile Defense had risen in importance relative to regional BMD. It was just after the invasion of Ukraine and various Chinese shenanigans in the, in the South China Sea. It was also just before the unfortunate JLENS uh, incident, which was an experimental aerostat uh, nearby here, designed to get after just this kind of problem. But Winnefeld posed the most important, I would say, threshold question for today, which is why. Why is it that we should defend against cruise missiles, or UAVs for that matter, if we're not going to contend with the big nuclear ICBM threat from Russia and China? For years, many folks have answered this question in the negative, that we don't need to. After all, the Soviets had nuclear slickums, and we chose to deter them and other forms of nuclear attack with the threat of retaliation. We've got nukes, they wouldn't dare. They'll be deterred QED. I would say that unimaginative formulation is almost, it seems like it's based in a, a kind of hubris about the homeland as a sanctuary. Uh, it's unfortunately too representative of conventional wisdom today. The problem we're facing is not a lesser included set of strategic nuclear attack. Rather, non-nuclear attack with strategic effect, whether by kinetic means or non-kinetic or both, is a different problem about what an adversary might think they can get away with beneath the nuclear threshold. Unfortunately, that problem is worsened by how U.S. air and missile defense efforts have long been characterized by a dichotomy. Defenses for the homeland have focused on long-range ballistic threats, while other air defense efforts have been limited to uh, regional and force protection applications almost to the exclusion of the homeland. And that compartmentalization assumes that battles in one place will only consist of certain types of threats, and battles elsewhere will consist of others. 
but a changed environment, a strategic environment, and the proliferation of sophisticated threats have come to make that uh, dichotomy increasingly obsolete. Whether we used to call it national and theater or homeland and regional, it kind of ignores the basic simple fact that North America is a region too. And as such, the full threat, the full panoply of UAV, cruise missile, and other threats that we have to be concerned about over there may also uh, matter here closer to home. While the 2019 Missile Defense Review well described the missile threat spectrum, neither its actions nor the associated budgets and programs at that time did that much about it. Beyond taking note of studies underway and promising to designate an executive agent, we're mostly left to admiring the problem. And as a result, time has ticked by. The near complete lack of homeland cruise missile and related forms of air defense has created a deterrence problem and a vulnerability that near, near peer adversaries now seek to exploit. An adversary seeking to change America's strategic calculus may be tempted to employ long range conventionally armed strikes to achieve strategic effects while remaining beneath the nuclear threshold. Deterring this kind of attack requires an element, at least, of deterrence by denial. Now, instead of thinking about missile threats as some kind of boutique threat, we should learn the lessons of, frankly, the last decade or so and recognize, recognize that they are, in the words of Assistant Secretary of Defense John Plum, weapons of choice. When I hear folks talking about truck bombs as a more desirable way to attack the homeland, I feel like I'm in a time warp. It's all very 1995. But just in case you were under a rock, we've seen tactical missiles and cruise missiles in particular used in large numbers, 2,800 and counting in the first 125 days of the Ukraine war. But of course, there was also Nagorno-Karabakh, the Abkhake attacks of 2019 uh, in Saudi Arabia where President Biden is visiting this week. At the center of this missile threat spectrum is the humble but reliable cruise missile. Hypersonic, this, that, and the other thing gets a lot of the buzz but it's the sturdy land attack anti-ship cruise missiles that everyone seems to reach for early and often. We see here on the right the Russian caliber sea launch cruise missile and the kind of standoff range it, it might have. And on the left, the air-launched KH-101 or AS-23A. Now the Russians claim that the KH-101 has a range of some 4,500 kilometers. This graphic, from a polar perspective, shows what that reach gets you even if fired from a standoff position above the North Warning System. When Russia fired calibers into Syria from thousands of kilometers away in 2015, of course, they didn't do so because they were concerned about the A2AD bubbles from ISIS. Uh, it, was, it sure looked like messaging about their capabilities. Following Seth, thanks to the combatant commands, I should single out uh, the leadership of one other person here, uh, General Van Herc, who's probably more than anyone been responsible for shaping the conversation about the strategic problem we're discussing today. This is a quote from his congressional testimony in March, I believe it was, highlighting that vulnerability and deterrence gap beneath the nuclear threshold. But again, it's a mistake to think of this as a NORTHCOM idiosyncrasy. The threat to North, to North America is about the relationship to other geographic and functional combatant commands, and thus America's role in the world. So I commend to you an op-ed from May 31 by both General Van Herc and General Jacqueline Van Ovost, the head of U.S. Transcom. Why Transcom? Some 85% of the joint forces within the U.S. homeland, and an effort to shape U.S. calculations could include efforts to impede our flow of forces and power projection. General Roper this morning said, to bring us to our knees. The old think legacy of that homeland regional dichotomy and its manifestations in our UCP, our organizational structure and resourcing, and our approach to air and missile defense has created gaps and seams that our enemies will exploit. Which brings us to the need to, th to thwart or blunt that threat and introduce doubt that it would succeed. The Biden administration is to be commended for not adopting a no first use nuclear policy, but deterrence by the threat of punishment is not enough. It will have to be a mix, uh, a mix of deterrence by denial as well. We want to give uh, credit to the Congressional Budget Office for releasing a uh, report just over a year ago on this topic. They were tasked to look at architectures and elements that could contribute to nationwide cruise missile defense. It helped advance the discussion. It has a lot of really useful budget data. It was a, a very instructive contribution. Unfortunately, their architectures were uh, a bit impractical 
and frankly unaffordable. A few assumptions deserve particular uh, attention. First, an apparent uh, focus on defending everything, an apparent conflation of the defended asset list with the critical asset list. Second, closely related, a perimeter-based defense design, which lacks defense in depth and layers. And only one type of sensor per architecture with elements, while selected to maximize detection range and decision time, which is understandable, it also impaired the quality of the defense. And finally, an, a relative over-reliance upon uh, fighters, especially for identification and engagement. Again, an understandable choice because of the sensitivity of shooting at things in American airspace. But the combat identification challenge, while real, is not necessarily best solved by having a fighter pilot try to find an incoming missile and look out the window to positively confirm it's a threat. Colonel Strohmeyer is a fighter pilot, and he can tell you why that might not be uh, ideal. This is our, uh, our image, not theirs, depicting the cross-range challenge of even getting fighters there uh, on time. But again, it's an important report, and I commend it uh, to your reading. So we decided to take our own crack at the problem. Now, I know what you're thinking. Boy, oh boy, a think tank report uh, waving generally in the direction of some desirable capability. I know, I get tired of those too. So we decided to do something a little different, building a defense design and costing it. But first, we identified some principles uh, to inform that design. The beginning of wisdom uh, is that you, as we heard from General Roper this morning, is that you can't defend everything. It would be foolhardy to try. Unlike the ballistic missile discussion of the 1990s, frankly, population centers may not necessarily be the most uh, significant target for non-nuclear strategic attack. In this report, we don't go to the opposite extreme, however, of merely point defense and instead point to a broad area defense approach, which is, turns out it's pretty useful uh, because there's a lot of critical assets that are clumped together in certain parts of the country. Second is multi-mission. When asked about this topic recently, Deputy Secretary of Defense Ka uh, Dr. Kathleen Hicks uh, emphasized the need to approach it in an integrated and multi-mission way. And you'll see in our architecture the toothing for adjacent missions like counter UAS and more advanced problems like uh, hypersonic threats. Third, the full attack life cycle. Not merely earlier indications and warning, but also means to hold at risk bombers or, or submarines. As General Van Herc and Admiral Richard have talked about, influencing the threat and communicating to the enemy, campaigning, as it were, to pass along that we're on to them. Defense in depth, in a way the opposite of a perimeter defense or point defense, with enhanced warning time and multiple opportunities for threat classification and decision time but also layers of sensors and effectors. Fifth, it's nice to say that we want to maximize mobility and flexibility, but sometimes the best can be the enemy of the good, both for cost reasons and also to resist the temptation to fly things away to other parts of the world at the drop of a hat. It may be better to have some fixed and dedicated assets uh, that are bolted down, dedicated to the homeland, which is, after all, our top uh, defense goal. Second, or sixth, uh, throw nothing away. And here we have a special opportunity, I'd suggest, uh, to test the department's concept of integrated deterrence, which is to say pulling together both defense and non-defense assets. There's a lot of things within CONUS that can and should be brought together. Many of them are not DOD. And finally, affordability. Even if on paper homeland defense is the top goal, we all know that it will not be pursued if it's going to cost a half trillion dollars. And this principle is a measure of the su success of all the prior ones. To this, I would add a corollary, uh, that, and that is a, of timeliness, uh, and it needs to be relevant to the threat. This means substantial activities in this decade, not waiting until the next. It means we cannot wait for the uh, completion of exotic space-based sensor layers, nor for the nirvana of JADC2, should it eventually be realized. In a few minutes, you're going to see the elements, layers, and phases we lay out. But our purpose in doing so is not to say that this is the end-all, be-all, or the precise solution. On the contrary, uh, what, our point here is to show that this is a soluble problem, and it does not need to cost a half trillion dollars. Since we're pretty critical of everybody else, I'll be self-critical. Uh, instead of trying to defend everything with the result that, the, uh, that nothing is defended especially well, we kind of do the opposite. And we go to a very thick defense of a handful of areas with multiple layers of sensors and interceptors. In other words, we went high 
high end on capability. So what you're going to see in some respects may be uh, too robust, even if it is a fraction of the cost of other folks. And as you'll hear from Wes, we also went very conservative on the costing estimates at every turn. Uh, the elements we used as the baselines consistently at the higher end in multiple types. We also added cost categories that are not present in CBO for things like systems integration. So it's a robust architecture, but there's lots of room for paring it back a bit for still lower cost solutions. As the Deputy Secretary has said about this issue, our thinking here has to change. It's not just about rogue state ballistic missiles anymore. The threat gets a vote, it's already voted, and it is voted for a spectrum of especially aerial threats. And the sophistication and the kind of assumptions that we've long brought to bear in the regional contexts must now be applied here at home as well. The good news is that efforts to realize Homeland Cruise Missile Defense have already begun. The road to Homeland Cruise Missile Defense for North America will probably go through Guam. And efforts for the defense of Guam will be especially instructive for element selection, systems integration, and command and control development. Both PB-22 and 23 included funds for Homeland Cruise Missile Defense experiments, towers, OTHRs, both of which you'll see in our architecture in spades. Vice Admiral John Hill of the Missile Defense Agency has said that the defense of Guam is probably the hardest problem his agency faces. It may also be the most important. If we can get that right, and we will, its lessons will inform global air and missile defense efforts suited, after all, to the central challenge of our time. So to walk through our defense design, let me turn things over to Colonel Matt Strohmeyer, call sign NOMAD. Uh, uh, NOMAD's a career Air Force pilot and operational war planner uh, and a strategist who's been the genesis for defense concepts like agile combat employment and strategic shaping. Uh, he was most recently at US NORTHCOM and NORAD, where he designed and led General Van Herc's Global Information Dominance experiments. Matt, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Tom, for that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you for uh, the other panelists here, for Lee, for moderating, for Wes, and then the other uh, authors on the report, and also for uh, US NORTHCOM and General Roper and Seth uh, for the remarks this morning. So I think it's important to note that uh, while I'm an Air Force fellow at CSIS, my views and those expressed in our report do not necessarily reflect those of the Air Force or the Department of Defense. And with those caveats out of the way, let's just dive into our homeland defense design. So in designing a capable defense for credible deterrence, we sought to apply the seven principles that Tom just highlighted and then apply them across what becomes for us five different layers. You can think of these layers as essentially our defense in depth. Rather than having one brittle layer, having defense across the life cycle of a cruise missile or other types of threats. And those layers that we'll walk through are resourced with individual elements. You can think of these as the capabilities, the technologies that go inside each one of those layers. And then the report has those layers and elements phased in over the course of three phases for the next eight years. So to start with the first layer, layered defense in depth, what does that look like? For us, defense in depth and, those, and the five layers are all about time and options. Increasing the amount of time available to influence a threat. And our design starts far left of launch of that cruise missile threat, and even left of a bomber or submarine threat that it might emerge from, and going left as far, uh, as far as getting to the decision makers that would decide to attack North America. This first layer, global threat awareness, seeks to apply global rather than regional perspectives to how we see strategic competitors and how they might take offensive action against us, allowing us to take more of a global response to deter those actions. This layer is all about gaining time and decision advantage. It seeks to go far left of launch the days and even weeks prior to a possible attack, to identify changes in adversary patterns of life, and then to identify proactive options for how we might deter such an attack. The layer builds on recent efforts by NORTHCOM and NORAD and their guide or global information dominance experiments to move from a more regional, depicted here, to a more global perspective. In the days leading up to a potential attack, competitors may change their pattern of life in ways that may be observable, especially if we are sensing on a more global perspective as they look to set their force for an attack. The, ab the advent of increased commercial space sensing and the application of artificial intelligence to these sources can allow in the aggregate for us to gain a better understanding of changes in those adversary patterns of life. These insights can get, then give opportunities to combatant commands to rapidly collaborate and take equally global actions to deter. These type of actions may be an example of what the department refers to as integrated deterrence. 
The second layer for us, building on that global threat awareness, is what we refer to as the 21st century version of the distant early warning line, or dew line, of the Cold War that provides 360 degree early warning of air and maritime threats to North America. The goal of this layer is not a high fidelity tracking and identification of threats, but rather just initial detection and then custody of those threats. The technology that we're leveraging for this layer is known as over the horizon radar. Uh, over the horizon radar or OTHR uses large arrays of radars that are uh, that radar signals that are bounced off of the ionosphere to detect air and maritime targets at extreme ranges of over thousands of kilometers. The goal is not again high fidelity tracking of threats, but rather the ability to search large areas and identify and maintain custody of those threats, providing not just minutes but hours of early warning that it can increase our decision space and the response options that General Roper talked about. OTHR is a proven technology. It's ready today and leveraged by Australia through their Jindalee Over the Horizon Radar Network, or JORN, and was recently announced by Canada as, as having a major investment in OTHR for uh, warning and awareness of the northern approaches to North America. Inside that, that second layer is our third layer, known for us as Wide Area Surveillance. This layer seeks to maintain custody of possible threats coming from those initial OTHR detections, allowing us to refine possible target areas and then prepare defense options. This layer combines existing active and passive sensors, many of which were not originally designed to track missile threats for an integrated sensing network to maintain low fidelity custody as threats approach those target areas. Sensors that, are integrated, that would be integrated in this layer include things like FAA's air traffic radars, these radars and the algorithms on them were designed for medium and high altitude air traffic and have greatly reduced coverage as seen here with the green and yellow uh, indications for low altitude objects. NORAD recently demonstrated the ability to take the existing radars and unlock the raw data coming off them and identify targets not seen with those legacy algorithms. And while these sensors are planned for upgrades, maintaining custody of threats at low altitude over North America requires the integration of additional active and passive sensors. Active sensors such as NOAA's weather radar constellation that exists across North America. These uh, weather radars, which are depicted in here, uh, can be integrated to augment the detection capability. Sensors such as these radars could cover much of North America, and while they have a slow scan rate and limited low altitude ability, could provide another source of custody if integrated with other existing sensors. You can see here it depicted one of those NOAA weather radars that were able to pick up a flock of birds as it took off. In this case, those birds being very low radar cross-section targets, indicating that it is possible to use those radars for tracking air targets. But we also need to be able to integrate other uh, sensors, such as, for example, Customs and Border Patrol's Siri, uh, constellation of aerostats, or TARS, that exists along the southern border of the United States. Uh, that are, and that are also able to sense air targets out to 200 nautical miles. Integrated into a larger homeland defense system, these sensors could supplement custody of threats that are in transit over North America. But it's not just active sensors. It's also passive sensing that can help maintain custody for, just like back in World War I, the passive sensing is seen here could help us maintain warning and awareness of those air threats. If we know just the location and power of an emitter, such as cell phone towers or radio or TV tower emitters, can allow us to, through, to get a rough geolocation of non-cooperative air threats through passive and multi-static sensing. North America, as seen here, possesses a very robust constellation of those sensors that can allow us to be able to bring that passive sensing together, combine it with active sensing to get a more integrated picture for wide area surveillance. The fourth layer for us is one of the most, and one of the key layers as far as our preferential defense is something that is known as PADS, or prioritized area defenses. Rather than defending all of North America, these pads provide robust detection and defense against low altitude missile threats over critical tar targets in large defended areas. These pads consist of networks of sensor towers that are combined with persistent surface to air interceptors to provide a highly capable defense of the top tier of targets against North America. So why a pad of networked sensor towers instead of a single high power sensor? Well, it turns out that the earth curves. And that curvature creates a real challenge for detecting low altitude targets at range. The radar horizon, for example, for a ground-based sensor, regardless of its power, is approximately 40 kilometers, allowing a low altitude cruise missile threat to sneak underneath that sensor to the target area. Elevating a sensor, while it can help mitigate the radar horizon challenge, comes with its own challenges of getting enough power to the radar to allow it to see the threats at the ranges that you need to be able to expect and intercept. 
By contrast, in our design, by leveraging lower cost towered radars seen here in yellow and EOIR sensors on those towers, a pad can cover a larger area while simultaneously maintaining robust detection and tracking of those low altitude threats. A template pad that's seen here has, is made up of 19 network sensor towers with both medium range radars and EOIR sensors to aid not only in detection and tracking, but also identification of threats. These towers are combined then with medium range interceptors located here at four notional locations that provide 48 different interceptor missiles to incoming threats. And those are combined within a long range interceptor near the center of the pad with eight missiles that allow us to be able to handle a range of threats potentially up at low altitude. When we put this pad together, it covers over 500 kilometers in diameter, and that's an area of around 200,000 square kilometers. Included in the pad design is a multi-mission integrated test bed. Think of it like local JADC2 to allow for integration of emergent sensors and effectors, as well as the command and control of those systems. This test bed and the associated operators are, would be federated up to the national homeland defense level. So the use of a pad design with overlapping sensor coverage is all about time. A threat that's approaching the pad at low altitude from thousands of kilometers away would initially have been detected by over the horizon radar and then maintained custody of by the wide area surveillance as it approached the edge of the pad. Once over the pad itself, the assumed target at, with an assumed target at pad center, the distance of 250 kilometers that that th threat would transit over the pad provides or equates really to what is referred to up here as time to decide. How much time defenders have to determine if and how to engage the threat. In the case of the templated pad, defenders have almost 15 minutes of high quality detection and tracking time over the pad to decide to engage, to decide to engage with enough time to keep that threat out of the specific pad defended area. The fifth layer for us beyond the pads themselves is risk-based mobile defense. So with these pads that obviously provide the static persistent sensors and shooters, they're augmented by this fifth layer. This layer includes fighter and airborne early warning assets like the E-7 Wedgetail to allow for both forward deployment to cover the launch platform avenues of approaches like adversary bombers over the Arctic and also to provide additional defense over areas that potentially are at higher risk given the specific threat or early warning detections. This can not only help us to canalize possible avenues of approach for adversaries but also to create deterrent effects by holding at risk the launch platforms even before those cruise missiles would be released. The various five layers of our, our defense design that we've outlined here uh, are deployed over the course of three phases over the next five years, or excuse me, the next eight years. The first phase includes the deployment of the prototype pad over certain critical areas that you can see here on the eastern seaboard. In addition to that initial deployment of the prototype pad, we begin the integration of those wide area passive and active sensors throughout not, much of North America. And then critically, the, uh, in this first phase, is the deployment of four over-the-horizon radars facing the northern approaches of North America and, and Alaska. The second phase uh, de uh, deploys four additional over-the-horizon radars, two to the east coast and then two to the west coast, and then four additional pads uh, over several different critical areas over North America. The third phase sees the expansion of several of the PAD capabilities up to what is known to us as a PAD Plus. This PAD Plus increases the existing PADs and the existing sensor towers up to 25, allowing it to see a approximately 350 kilometer radius from left to right depicted here. It also increases the number of medium range interceptors to 72 and adds a multi-mission interceptor that can cover almost the entire radius or the entire area that the PAD covers. This allows us to start expanding our missions both uh, not just from, from conventional slower cruise missiles, but also moving potentially into the hypersonic missile defense. That combined pad area, as you can see here, for one of the locations, namely the first pad, also includes an aerostat that, we would, that would be placed over that pad for additional coverage. That third phase, as depicted here, uh, it not only includes the addition of those pads and expanding those pads out, but also includes two over-the-horizon radars covering the southern approaches, which brings our total coverage to 360 degrees for that 21st century distant early warning line. It also includes the addition of the ability for fighters to be able to f rapidly forward deploy up to places like the Arctic to try to hold those avenues of approach at risk, and also the ability for us to use that episodic coverage from things like the E-7 to, again, re restrict the avenues of approach of potential attacks. 
when we look at the, the coverage that the pad alone provides and not, not even the distant early warning line or the wide area surveillance, you can see that we gain a very robust coverage of low altitude threats over most of the areas that those, that those pads cover. And the complete pad architecture, when it's, uh, when it's put, it, put together, uh, provides not only a capable preferential defense of North America, but also a credible deterrent to non-nuclear strategic attack. This defense design, however, is not built to be static, but to continually evolve and integrate emerging sensors, capabilities, and missions. These missions will undoubtedly include defense against hypersonic threats, as well as slower, small UAS threats. From a sensing perspective, space-based sensing of live threats will certainly be an important aspect, not only for cruise missile threats, but other emerging threats as well. I'll turn it over to Wes Rumbaugh, who will run through how this defense design not only provides that, ca that capable homeland defense, uh, defense, but also one that is economically feasible in the near term. Wes, over to you. Uh, so thank you, Matt, uh, and I'd just like to add my thanks to Tom, uh, Ian, and Ken, uh, our co-authors, as well as all of the reviewers who helped us uh, with this report, and then also the, the rest of our team. Uh, and of course, thank you to Lee uh, for uh, moderating the panel today. Uh, so I'm Wes Rumbaugh, uh, and I'm an associate fellow here with the CSIS Missile Defense Project. Uh, and in particular, I do most of our work on the missile-related elements of the defense budget. Uh, so now it's time to eat our vegetables. Uh, don't worry though, uh, there's only one slide with numbers on it. Uh, so I tried to keep a lot of it uh, sort of at the top level and examining the assumptions that go into the cost modeling. Uh, and then if you're curious for the gory details uh, of all of the cost uh, analysis, uh, that's why we have the appendix. Uh, but at the outset, I think it's useful to contrast kind of the cost of cruise missile defense and ballistic missile defense, uh, which is probably what most informs people's sort of generic mental cost baseline for how much things cost. Uh, air defense is generally cheaper on a platform to, pa uh, platform, to platform basis, uh, but it also requires more of those platforms to generate area coverage. Uh, so we've built a relatively robust and thick defense uh, because we think that layering and defense in depth are important. Uh, but that's also sort of a fundamental trade-off in cruise missile defense and ballistic missile defense. Uh, you don't have to invent a bunch of stuff the same way that we had to uh, when we started deploying GMD, uh, but you have to sort of sh shop at Costco uh, for the capacity side. So I want to start first by just comparing some of the assumptions of the CBO. Uh, uh, cost estimates in particular, uh, and some of this overlaps with Tom's earlier discussion of the CBO study, uh, but I want to focus on particularly how these things, uh, how these assumptions affect the overall cost uh, of the architectures. So I think in the discussion of affordability of homeland cruise missile defense, most of the estimates or the, the disparity in estimates over how much these systems will cost are driven not by mathematical uh, things or not by differences in data sources, but by the assumptions that are used to put together the calculations and how the architectures are put together. So I think that the, the, first, uh, the first part of the table, the primary cost driver is in defended area uh, because it determines how many assets you need for the defensive task. And so the CBO's assumption of needing to create a defensive perimeter around the United States uh, creates uh, significant requirements for number of platforms uh, that drives their costs up. Whereas we have a, a preferential defense you can sort of concentrate sensors and shooters in key areas uh, while still requiring uh, fewer total platforms and thus reducing the overall cost. Uh, this, I think, is the key component of a, an affordable homeland cruise missile defense architecture. The second assumption uh, that the CBO, of the CBO study that increases the cost, I think, is the reliance on a single sensor type. Uh, it's necessary in their perimeter-based defense for the warning times that they would need, uh, but it forces the CBO to examine basically exclusively more expensive aircraft uh, and satellites exclusively. So the CBO rightly points to the significant benefits uh, putting sensors at higher altitudes for air defense, uh, like we sort of talked about earlier, but there are also important limitations. And uh, most importantly for the cost side, that decision precludes CBO from looking at towered and more importantly ground-based uh, radars in their architectures which offer some opportunities for cost savings. This also kind of transitions to the third point which is about sensor persistence 
in particular. So the way that they achieve persistence in their architecture with aircraft requires operating them 24-7, 365. Uh, and so flying aircraft for that long and that persistently gets expensive. It drives up your operations and sustainment costs uh, fairly substantially. Our architecture, by comparison, uses sort of these towered radars and ground-based radars for the persistent element, and so that saves a little bit of cost. The, uh, I think the fourth thing that we looked at that's a, a little bit different uh, is the assumptions about system integration. So CBO's study had a single sensor paired to basically a, a single interceptor site, uh, and so they didn't uh, assess an additional cost for system integration. The diversity of platforms that we looked at, I think, required us to sort of have a, a more conservative estimate regards to the cost of system integration. And so we added an additional uh, $500 million on the in initial portion of the, the uh, architecture for those system integration efforts. Uh, and then the, the final major difference is in, in terms of engagement method. Uh, CBO analyzed a, a mixture of fighter aircraft as well as uh, long-range SAMs. Uh, and those additional fighter aircraft in particular can drive uh, significant costs. Um, instead, we looked at a mixture of medium and long-range interceptors, uh, which again contains costs, uh, and we've also spoken to some of the operational reasons. Among all those differences, though, I do want to emphasize how valuable the CBO study was, particularly as a data source, uh, just in terms of its compilation of public data uh, and its ability to publicize a lot of that data. Uh, we had to do something similar uh, in, in terms of basing our estimates on public sources of data uh, and finding analogous systems to be able to, to cost some of these things uh, and to, with some adjustments for changes in our configuration. Uh, where the CBO had relevant data, we attempted to use it as much as possible and generally used the most conservative estimates in their cost ranges. So I promise this is the only slide with numbers, uh, but this is uh, our sort of total assessed costs for each of the component systems and then the, the totals for the CS architecture. So with the uh, PAD and PAD plus all the way through the phase three as then, and then uh, sustainment over a 20 year period. So I think at the outset, some of you might be thinking that the sustainment numbers uh, are a bit light. Uh, and that comes down to a me another methodological decision that we made uh, that I'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, but first, I want to talk through some of the decisions we made for the costing of each of the elements uh, and how we kind of uh, derive some of those things. But there's a more dis thorough discussion uh, in the appendix of the report. So for the over-the-horizon radars and the pad radars, uh, we lack good specific data uh, for acquisition costs, specifically for the over-the-horizon radars, because it's sort of a, a new capability, so it's something that's still in rdt and &E, so we don't have unit costs. Uh, one of our subject matter experts gave us uh, a total acquisition cost of $600 million, uh, which we then divided between MILCON costs and the actual radar costs. And that was important because, so the most difficult thing for both the over-the-horizon radars and the pad radars was calculating a sustainment figure. Um, the, the way that the Department of Defense usually reports uh, operations and maintenance and sustainment data uh, is based on type of force, but not at a system level. Uh, and you can usually find some of that data from selected acquisition reports for major uh, defense acquisition programs. Uh, but there aren't any of those for ground-based radars. Uh, but the Missile Defense Agency does have operations and maintenance data for its TIPI-2 radars. So to calculate the sustainment uh, for the over-the-horizon rad radars and the pad radars, what we did was calculated an acquisition to sustainment cost ratio for yearly sustainment that found that yearly sustainment is about 8% of the acquisition cost and then used that methodology uh, and applied it to the acquisition costs that we had for the over-the-horizon radars uh, as well as the pad radars. Uh, for the basis of the pad radars, uh, we used estimates for the Army Sentinel as sort of the cost baseline uh, and the, the basis for the majority of the radars. And then at the center of the pad, uh, we had an additional more, sort of a, a little bit more of a boutique uh, radar capability uh, that's an Aegis fire control radar. Uh, and that, uh, at the center of the pad, we got uh, an, an additional estimate from a, a subject matter expert interview. 
Uh, for the aerostats portion, uh, we had only one orbit of them deployed in the NCR uh, and used the more conservative of the CBO estimates, uh, including their assumption that you would need to do sort of a reacquisition after 10 years. So when I flip over to the budget chart uh, in a second, you'll see the, a sort of uh, spike in acquisition, I think, in like years 16 or 17, uh, and that is the reacquisition uh, of aerostats. For the wedge tail radars, uh, we didn't have unit costs for the US configuration uh, because uh, it's still an RDT and E program. So we had to derive a unit cost from the UK acquisition program. Uh, so they bought uh, five aircraft for approximately $2 billion. Uh, we assessed that the mission would require about two aircraft. Uh, and so that's what the acquisition and sustainment uh, denominator is there. Uh, and then for the uh, sustainment cost, we used estimates from the P-8 Poseidon aircraft, uh, which uses the same airframe as the wedge tail, and then tacked on a little extra cost because it's got a, a more capable radar uh, on top of that. Uh, and then finally, the layered shooters, uh, command and control and system integration components. I kind of rolled those all up uh, into, into one line. Uh, for the medium range interceptors that you saw in the earlier charts, uh, we based our estimates for those costs on the Patriot M903 launchers and the PAC-3 MSE interceptor. For the long range interceptor, we used the SM2 Block 3C. Uh, and the multi-mission long range interceptor, we used SM6 data uh, as the basis for those calculations. Those were used to just kind of give us a hard data source and some sort of like formulation uh, rather than a, a specific uh, endorsement of any of those particular capabilities. Uh, for the VLS then, for the launcher at the center of the pad, we also had to use data from ship-based VLS. Uh, the uh, budget documents for like the Aegis Ashore or any of the Army formulations that uh, are launching uh, or have a, a land-based VLS capability, they didn't have specific unit cost data. Uh, so they, we may be purchasing a little bit of extra VLS capacity uh, in that sense, but that's the best we could do from the public data. Um, and then for the sustainment portion of that estimate, uh, we used more, the more conservative CBO estimate for their LR SAM sites uh, of $20 million per year. The one element that we weren't able to produce a cost estimate, and it's included in some of the description of the phase three, uh, is some of the high-powered microwave capabilities. Uh, that are discussed in the report. Uh, since those systems remain prototypes, there's not really an analogous system for me to be able to publicly provide a, a confident uh, cost estimate at this time. All right, the numbers are gone, uh, although numbers did feed the chart. Uh, <laughs> another important distinction uh, between our cost estimates and CBOs uh, is how we sort of think about the time horizon. So the CBO doesn't really bound its time horizon. Uh, it has 20 year, just an overall 20 year sustainment cost and then uh, an acquisition cost. We tried to look at it uh, from a bounded time horizon uh, in, in particular because I think it's a better measure of affordability to look at what the average yearly cost or be able to break it down by sort of a, a yearly cost rather than the total cost. The total cost can produce uh, a significant amount of sticker shock uh, in many cases. But it's important to know what the denominator for that number is. What are you dividing that number by? Because that determines uh, to some degree what the yearly investment level is and whether or not that's a, a sustainable uh, investment. So this chart depicts how the cost of the systems get spread over that 20 year period. Uh, we tried to spread it as evenly as possible, uh, and that creates a little bit of a, a, a funkiness to the phasing, mostly because phase two acquires so many uh, assets. So phase one is years one and two. Uh, phase two is years three through six, so extending that out and doubling that period of time. Uh, and then phase three acquisition is years seven and eight. Uh, and again, it's sort of a rough estimate of the timing. Uh, it could probably be smoothed out even more as you're working through the programmatics. Uh, but I think it's important to sort of display and think about uh, the costing in that way. Uh, and it also shows why the sustainment number, the total sustainment number may look a little bit low because sustainment gets phased in. Uh, and especially because phase, the phasing is a key part of our architecture. 
Uh, and so that means that phase three assets have fewer years of sustainment counted in the time period than phase one assets. Uh, the final architecture we were able to estimate uh, once you get to all of the phase three has about a yearly sustainment cost uh, of about $1.2 billion per year. Uh, so if you calculate that cost over 20 years the same way that CBO did, uh, it would be about $24.5 billion. All right, and then uh, it's important to acknowledge that cost estimates are just that, they're estimates. Uh, and they can give you a sense of the general level of investment, uh, but no architecture is going to survive contact with environmental impact reviews or the first time that you have to have a system integrations test. Uh, it's going to be incredibly difficult, and so it's, uh, it gives you a ballpark in a sense, but it's important to think through some of the contingencies and the predictable things that we can think about that are uh, plausible alternatives. So the first thing uh, that uh, is, a, is a plausible area and a potential area for cost growth uh, is in the towered radars. Uh, we based it on the Sentinel radar, uh, which has one spinning face to produce 360 degree coverage. If instead you need three faces or a, a multi-face design, uh, because uh, for whatever reason the, the spinning configuration uh, doesn't, doesn't work out, then that's a, a potential area for cost growth. Uh, and then the other thing is we based our estimates assuming that existing cell phone tower, phone tower, et cetera, infrastructure would be able to support some of these radars, and so that reduced some of our MILCON costs. Uh, but if all of that has to be built, obviously there's uh, an additional MILCON cost, and that's a potential area for cost growth. Uh, another area with, that we looked at in the appendix, uh, and that the, the uh, map image uh, demonstrates there, uh, where costs could be potentially trimmed, uh, where you have fewer overall OTHR locations, it will require a similar number of uh, radar arrays, but if you can co-locate them in such a way that you trim up some of your sustainment costs uh, and potentially some of your MILCON costs, uh, it's an opportunity for some cost savings. Uh, we were relatively aggressive uh, and conservative in terms of choosing the PAC-3 MSE as our medium range uh, interceptor configuration in terms of the cost. That's a, probably a higher cost interceptor uh, than you would uh, potentially need. Uh, and so if you look at other options like uh, NASAMs uh, or the Army's future if PIC, uh, those uh, are other areas where you could potentially save some of those costs. Uh, and if you had fewer types of interceptors uh, in particular, you might be able to trim some sustainment costs uh, in terms of the opportunities uh, for finding economies of scale there. Uh, and then the final thing is directed energy. Uh, if it is able to mature uh, substantially and is able to reduce your requirements for the number of kinetic interceptors uh, that you need, it can both reduce the cost per shot, uh, but then also potentially, depending on the sustainment of those configurations, uh, reduce the sustainment in the number of sites uh, that are required there. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lee to begin the panel discussion, and thank you again, Lee. Uh, thanks for your remarks. Uh, I wanted to start off the discussion. Uh, the report points to warnings from Dennis Gormley about the emerging cruise missile threat, and I just wanted to dig a little bit deeper about why the United States is no longer a sanctuary and why can't current platforms like the North Warning System handle that threat? Well, let me take the first part and hand it off. The, the Dennis Gormley, you're, you're referencing a, a scholar who's kind of been warning about the, the, the cru growing cruise missile threat for probably 20 years. Uh, he uh, unfortunately just passed away, but you know, I think it's, uh, we give him credit for, 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 for noting this uh, for, for a long time coming. Uh, I, I suppose the, uh, the infinite charity that the afterlife brings probably is restraining him from saying, I told you so, but there's been a lot of people who have said, I told you so, that we've got to keep an eye out for this, uh, and so really over the past decade, and that's kind of where we are today. And Lee, I'll just add to that, the, the North Warning System 
definitely served its purpose for the threat that it was built for, essentially looking at bombers at 36,000 feet coming up over the pole. What it wasn't built for necessarily was looking for low radar cross-section targets that are flying at low altitude over the same area. So I think both Canada and the U.S. have both said we, we've got to look at, at, uh, at modernizing that system to allow us to be able to see the threat that, is, that has changed based on what we see today. And another question I had about the architecture, um, you dig deep into the different elements, the technology elements, and I was hoping to talk more about what actually exists and what do we need to develop, what does DOD need to partner with industry to like actually create? No, that's, that's a great question. So I think uh, General Van Herc recently said that he, he is looking for industry to take this problem and just run with it creatively. Uh, though, and though we would strongly agree with that, I think what we tried to build was not a pie-in-the-sky design or something that may exist 10 years from now, but we use almost all existing proven technologies. To, and we just used them or we applied them in different ways with new paradigms. So for example, towered radars aren't really that, that new, but networking them together and using them in a different, in a different way uh, can really provide that coverage that we might want, but with systems that exist today, rather than waiting for it. There are some elements like high-powered microwave that are still kind of a little bit on the margin side. And then certainly we wanted to build this out with the toothing to get that multi-mission application down the road for hypersonic small UAS. Um, and, and then also the ability to bring in emerging sensors, like space-based sensors, that'll be such an important part of the, the hypersonic tracking layer of the future. Hey, I'll, just, I'll just jump in there and say, we would love to have a bunch of directed energy lasers on every pole kind of, a, kind of an architecture, and it would have been great to have said, oh, well, well, the space sensors will take care of that. But back to the Costco thing, you know, we're looking at th things that are on the shelf today. Uh, we can't wait around, this is the temporal element, we can't wait around until the, all those whiz-bang stuff uh, uh, you know, it becomes a retail item. And so we went, this is where I'll be self-critical again, uh, we went relatively conservative, uh, less exotic. It would have been great to have those things, but we wanted to be uh, the sort of thing that we could act on right now. And uh, a question I had for Wes, uh, when you look at the CBO report, it's the low end is 77 billion, uh, and then you all come in way lower than that. And is that because you're looking at existing systems you, and preferential defense? And I, I, I think that, yeah, I think that the, I, I would say that the majority of it is the preferential defense part. I think that that's the biggest cost driver uh, is deciding how much you're gonna defend. Uh, the contiguous United States is, is very large. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of square footage. Uh, which means that there's a lot of assets that you're, you're having to deploy. Uh, and so uh, it, it runs those numbers up there very quickly. And then the other thing uh, for a lot of those CBO numbers is aircraft are expensive to operate uh, and they're expensive to build. Uh, and so, uh, it, I mean, that's, that's something that we have to do in away games because uh, we need mobility uh, and we need the ability to operate. Uh, but in the U.S. homeland, we should sort of take advantage of the fact that uh, it is U.S. territory uh, and that the government can use sort of more ground-based assets to limit its costs uh, more effectively. And, you know, you all mentioned in the news, there's so much talk about defending the United States against hypersonic weapons. But I was hoping that you could talk about what we're learning from Ukraine and about the cruise missile threat. Well, I, I think, again, we, we are clearly uh, thinking about the, the advanced hypersonic cruise missile or, or glider threat, and it's why our element selection here was very clearly tied to the Mark 41 launcher uh, for that Aegis-centric uh, system. Why? So that when, in the fullness of time, uh, the, glide, the glide phase interceptor or whatever else that is coming out of a Mark 41 uh, arrives, that if, if the threat uh, demands it, that we, we're able to, to build that in. But in terms of the Ukraine side, you know, I, I think what we see there is, well, to quote John Plum, uh, that the weapons of choice are the slightly less exotic thing. Yeah, there's some demonstrations going on, the whiz-bang, Kinzel, you know, uh, uh, quasi-ballistic, uh, hypersonic, this, that, and the other thing. But there's lots and lots of cruise missiles. And that's what's here today, and I think that's why you're seeing General Van Herc, like when he testifies, he kind of draws a, a bright red line under that KH-101. Right? That's what the Russia likes to publicize. That's what they like to shoot off from the Caspian Sea into Syria. Or, according to news reports, they shot one into Ukraine the other day. And so these are garden-variety subsonic cruise missiles. 
uh, and that's where the threat is today. Uh, I also wanted to touch on, after reading the report, uh, defense of Guam. It seems like the Pentagon is all in in defending Guam. Uh, what can we learn from that and apply it to Homeland Cruise Missile Defense? So uh, I would say that while we, we did not build a, uh, deliberately did not build a nice pretty picture of Guam, uh, we could have put towers and such on Guam, uh, but we didn't uh, deliberately. We want to kind of see how that ripens. but. We've already heard from a number of DOD officials um, and from, for instance, the Missile Defense Agency that uh, you know, that's a hard problem and it's gonna have applicability here. Uh, a couple comments on Defense of Guam. Based on news reports and public statements on Capitol Hill and frankly here, um, it sure looks like it's gonna be a mix of Army and Navy assets. Uh, and I think if you look at our architecture here, you see a fairly straight line between the mix of assets uh, that are being publicly discussed for Guam and the mix of assets and the sources of the assets for this architecture. Uh, you also see, of course, we add in that extra money for systems integration. Assuming that it's not all gonna be worked out for Guam, we want some additional funds there to do that. So that is, Guam is, of course, US territory. Uh, it's the beginning of the Homeland Cruise Missile Defense uh, undertaking. Uh, but I would also again point to the, the thing being protected in the strategic logic of the defense of Guam, which is it's not just about the beaches and the people, although of course that's important, but it's the ability to project power uh, from those air bases and other things on Guam. And so that's also a lesson here, is what is it that we're trying to defend and for what purpose? And that's why again you see the head of Transcom and the head of, of, uh, of Northcom and Stratcom highlighting those kinds of things. And say that DOD and lawmakers want to invest in something like this in fiscal year 2024, like you outlined in the report. How soon could, we, could this become reality? Like, what are you expecting? Well, I might let Wes take some of that, but I'll just say real quick at the beginning that uh, certainly hope that PB24 has a, a very substantial piece here. It's not just about cruise missiles again, it's about the broad air threat, it's about the broad air surveillance and detection and attribution and everything else. So it's not just about that one threat, uh, that, one, uh, that one threat. But um, let me turn to Wes in terms of the procurement timelines. I mean, I, I think that that timeline sort of going back to the answer that Tom just gave kind of depends on how much the architecture mirrors that uh, of what's going on on Guam and how much you're sort of getting out of those non-recurring investments in architecture on Guam. Uh, but I mean, that, that was sort of the point of not uh, looking at the, the whiz-bang investments in, in relying on things like uh, directed energy is, you know, you're talking about uh, surface air missiles, uh, ground-based radars. These are, these are the sorts of things that U.S. industry and the United States is already procuring. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's changing the number on the order sheet uh, for capabilities that are already existing today rather than uh, attempting to invent a bunch of new things. Um, what in terms of uh, initial investment, do, do you, should like the pads be funded first? Like what, like what are you looking at? Uh, I mean, I would kind of defer to Matt in terms of, like in terms of the sequencing, we kind of sequenced it in terms of the phases um, for, for a reason, and so there's sort of, I think that the, the nature of the architecture, and Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is sort of such that all of the investments are necessary together, because that is the, the point of the layering and the defense in depth, is to, to invest in a, all of the capabilities uh, together at the same time. Um, and so I, th I think that you would probably need to invest in most of the capabilities, and yeah. And, uh, Matt, do you want to jump on? I was just going to say, I think uh, certainly we, we heard General Roper say it, and I think General Van Herc has said it many times, that we have some serious domain awareness challenges right now, and shoring those up for these emerging threats that we see today are important. And that's why, like Wes said, we phased it in. And yes, the, the, the five layers we think are all important, mm -hmm. but we phased it in in a way that gets us capability very soon in the next few years for some of those the, like domain awareness for the northern approaches, for example, with OTHR. And then also, though, 
putting down a real credible uh, detection and defense capability over like that first pad so that you have real deterrence that's actually being put into the field. And we think that's not only important for deterrence, it's also important to show, hey, this is doable. You can do this. We can get capabilities in the field. We can learn from it. And then over the course of those phases, expand on it, what we learn from and expand on that the defense and deterrence capability. Uh, one of the interesting ideas I thought in the report was partnering with the FAA and NOAA and other organizations um, to get that domain awareness. Is that something that DOD has done before? Like, what, what kind of steps would they have to take to get there? So I'd say that, that so DOD partners very broadly with the interagency every day, like the, uh, NORAD defenders, whether they're, they're Canadian or American, sit almost side by side with the interagency as they're maintaining of awareness for North America, um, but they, uh, I think there's potentially opportunities to look at how we think about uh, whether it's sensor data, for example. We often think about it kind of stovepiped into the mission that it was designed for, for good reason. It's designed for that mission, but trying to look at opportunities to combine some of that data together in ways that we might not have been able to do in the past. So that, for example, if you have a sensor that was built for a, a mission uh, it may, it may be a counter narcotics mission or a, a border patrol mission. If you can take that same sensor and combine it with other sensors, even though that's only a small portion, you can start building out an aggregate that turns out that you can see potentially more than we thought we could. And, and for relatively small investment, not mm -hmm. building new sensors, but taking what currently exists for that layer three, that wide area surveillance layer. So, and that's what makes this, I would say, very near term, a, a unique opportunity and test case for the department's concept of integrated terms. Mm -hmm. um, I was gonna go to some of the audience questions. Uh, one question is, what will be the role of, D of DOD's Missile Defense Agency and the concept of Homeland Defense against cruise missiles? I, I'm just gonna point to the, the, uh, the HASC language about uh, for, for the forthcoming uh, NDAA. Um, reminding, gently reminding the department of the FY 2017 requirement to identify an executive agent. Uh, that decision has not been made. I think it'll probably be made soon based on uh, some, some comments made in, uh, in Capitol Hill, and that will ascertain, you know, who's going to be doing what in the, in, the, in the scheme of things. Okay, so we have to wait for that. <laughs> Um, another question, given the surprising concern of the U.S. being endangered, are we looking at the rise in cruise missiles? And also, are hypersonics going to be the certain future for such weapons? I'll, I'll, um, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll recur here to some, some themes that we put out in our, uh, since the, the audience member talked about the hypersonic stuff. Uh, when we put out a report in February called Complex Air Defense, uh, we called it that specifically to accentuate the aerodynamic, endoatmospheric quality of the threat. And we said, look, put aside the whole whiz-bang hypersonic stuff, just take note of the fact that the threat is going lower and is becoming more maneuverable. And that's kind of what ties all this together. And it's also, again, back to Deputy Secretary Hicks' uh, injunction to don't just think about one thing, think about the multi-mission thing, that's why you see the element selection here. That's why you see the two thing for, for counter UAS and hypersonic in our architecture today. That has to be the right solution. We can't develop a stovepipe for this, that, and the other thing. Uh, and we have to be smart about beginning that from the, uh, from the outset. Um, I think that's about all the time we have. Did you all have any closing comments? I would just say stay tuned. We're going to have a great couple panels here uh, from government uh, and from industry to tell us uh, uh, kind of where things stand and where things are could be going. All right, thank you.
All right, folks, well, welcome back to the, the second panel of our, our conference today on Homeland Cruise Missile Defense. We've got a, a number of great speakers to kind of give us an update on where things stand on the issue now and maybe some, uh, some outside perspectives on, on the CSIS report you heard about earlier. Uh, and so I'm going to turn this over to Jen Judson from Defense News to, uh, to moderate us. Thank you. Over to you, Jen. All right, thank you so much. Is my mic on? It sounds like it, okay. Hello and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies Homeland Cruise Missile Defense Conference's third panel of the day. Well, we had one speaker, so we did miss out on that first panel today, but um, this is a focus on the government's perspective. And my name is Jen Judson, I'm the land warfare reporter for Defense News, um, but I do focus as well on missile defense. Uh, today we have Brigadier General Paul Murray, the Deputy Director of Operations at North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD. Uh, Stan Stafira, Chief Architect at the Missile Defense Agency. Colonel Tony Behrens, Deputy Director at the Joint Integrated Air and Missile Defense Organization, and Dr. Pepe de Biazio, non-resident senior associate with the CSIS Missile Defense Project. I'll open it up for remarks, and then we'll get going with questions. And we'll start with you, General Murray. So I'll just be perfectly honest and speak probably for many of the people, at least uh, the two to my left. This is a fraught time for us to come speak about a topic like this, right? We're in the middle of budget seasons, NDAAs. Uh, it was a very detailed and, um, um, and good report, but um, to the extent that, you know, we have plans that are similar to this, unfortunately, we really can't get into a lot of those details. So what I thought what I would do then is, um, uh, is, is, is kind of set this in a broader context for, uh, for some of my remarks. You know, we, we nailed down very quickly here into the cruise missile defense portions of it, and, and we at NORAD and NORTHCOM are, are very uh, in tune with that, and we have plans and designs along the similar thing. But this fits into, into a broader, more uh, multi-domain capability that actually the VIN diagrams overlap. So the threats that we face are not just from cruise missiles, right? Uh, we have threats from the seafloor all the way up to space and, and even beyond in the outer space, if you will, a deeper space uh, in the near future. Um, and so we need to think through how cruise missile defense fits into the cyber domain and into the information domain when we here uh, think about this problem set. <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's kind of uh, part number one. So, uh, so with that in mind, let me tell you a little bit about how we at NORAD and NORTHCOM think through a defense design uh, like this type of uh, what, what CSIS did. Um, so first off, uh, what is a defense design, right? We, we had to ask ourselves that question. Well, it's not a strategy. Right, a strategy is, is, is broader uh, than, than this level of planning. It includes um, theater security cooperation. It includes human capital. So we're not talking about a strategy. So we can't pull that you know, uh, recipe book off the shelf. It's not a plan, right? Uh, an operational plan or a con plan. That's how we fight today with the stuff we have now. So a defense design is really a set of concepts as you see here, um, it's a set, it's aspirational. It's in many ways a roadmap for how we get to how we want to fight, how we have to fight now uh, with what we have to how we would want to fight in the future um, in and from the homelands. Uh, and so, and it, it, it's also not a series of wish lists, right? A defense design isn't just a series of, of systems that we'd like to buy. Uh, or capabilities we'd like to have, although those are part of it. In fact, what really the defense design does is it informs all of those things. It is a series of concepts that informs your strategy uh, for tomorrow, and it, it informs your, uh, your plans for today, and it informs your, the capabilities that you would like to see, from our perspective, the department uh, procure and, uh, and present to the, uh, the combatant commanders. So with that, we deliberately didn't use any of those normal processes that one does uh, when we built the defense design, um, often because those are long processes. To build a strategy under the normal uh, Department of Defense process is a two-year process. Uh, our commander only had three years. Uh, you know, most of these four stars get three years in their command, and to take two of it just to build a defense plan was not what we, you know, what was uh, acceptable. 
Uh, so we looked into other ways of how to how to do this, and we actually we went to the uh, to uh, a software development type of mentality. If any of you have heard of Agile, it's uh, it's not hierarchical. It's certainly not sequential and waterfall. And the idea is that you put a team of experts together from across your organization. In our case, from across the Napoleonic, you know, J1, J2, J3 operations, plans, and everything. You put one, uh, um, you don't really even put one person in charge, you put kind of a conductor out there, and you iterate very quickly on the concepts that you're trying to build. And that's what we did about two years ago when uh, General Van Herc came in uh, right around that time. He, we put this team together, it was my predecessor who led it, and they did a quick iteration on what type of capabilities do we not to do? How do we want to defend the nation, uh, the continental nation, uh, if you will, uh, in in the future, and we picked three time epics, uh, a 2030 time epic, which you can imagine uh, really is, uh, or excuse me, a 2025 time epic, which at that time was just a couple of years away, five years away, um, and the principal military threat for that time epic was, and obviously still is, uh, Russia. Uh, we took a, a quick look at the 2030 time epic, and there we see, as we look out into the future, we see the Chinese threat, uh, growing um, in the type of capabilities that we're talking about today and the type of capabilities um, uh, that we see in the future. And then, uh, and, and maybe to some type of parity perhaps at that time, time epic. Uh, and then, uh, then also a 2035 time epic. And that's that roadmap that I talked about, or how we get, uh, I think, I think the, Tom, your team called them phases. Uh, we call them time epics and kind of how we get out and think about out into the future the capabilities that we need. Okay, um, so, so once you've got that, that basic scaffolding, what we did next was we looked a deep dive into that 2025 time epic. Um, so that we did the, the, the one sprint kind of does, uh, it leads into a bunch of other agile sprints uh, to flesh out the bones of that, of that time epic and, and really put some meat on it. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Well, we take a deep dive into the threat. Um, and for, instead of a broad threat across 15 years, we take a very detailed threat. We get detailed with the intelligence community, with the intelligence inside of ours, and we really think deeply about it uh, so that we understand it, so that we, one, don't ask for capabilities uh, that the threat maybe doesn't present, and two, uh, that we can compare that to capabilities that we already have uh, that, that might be able to uh, counter that threat today. Um, the next thing we do, or, or another types of ways we go into the details, is that we, uh, we survey the domain aware land, uh, awareness landscape. You've heard it said many times, if you, can't, if you can't see the threat, you can't defend against it, right? And so uh, one of the sprints that we did was to look across uh, the entire department, interagency, and uh, how are ways that we can uh, de uh, gain domain awareness about, detect the threat, and maintain custody of it. And then, of course, uh, you've all heard the cliche that, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, amateurs do tactics, uh, professionals do logistics. And we did an entire sprint just on what would be the logistics requirements of the type of capabilities uh, that were in this report as well as uh, the, the way we were thinking about the threat. And in that 2025 epic, we kind of came up with four big ideas. Um, first off, we found that there's a need for capa foundational capabilities, and, uh, and the team today talked about that. Before we even think about kinetic defense in some of these instances, there's foundational capabilities that we need to lay, and we came up with four of them. Uh, our commander, the last time he was here, talked about it, so I won't go into the details, but they are domain awareness, first and foremost, uh, talked a lot about today. Um, information dominance, so once you make, once you... Once you've sensed the, everything with domain awareness, how do you make sense of that? How do you use that information? Uh, and how do you bring it all together? And here we're thinking things like single plane of glass. And then, uh, okay, you've got, you've got data, you've presented it well, how do you make better decisions with that? And for that is our third main big idea that we came out of it, which was um, decision superiority. How do you make better decisions? How do you make faster decisions at the speed of relevance with things like AI and ML? That was another foundational capability. And then finally, how do you do all that on a global scale? 
and that's global integration, and that's actually the effort uh, that Nomad mentioned that he was a big part of when he was in our team with the global in information dominance exercises. Um, and those were foundational. The other thing that we found was we need policy. Uh, this sprint told us that um, we need to, to continue the work similar to what uh, CSIS has done. We need policy on what to defend, uh, i.e. the places that you want to defend in the United States, perhaps is one way to say it. And then uh, what do you want to defend against? From, and it's been mentioned today, from do you want to defend against UASs all the way up to hypersonic cruise missiles to hypersonic glide vehicles or where in between there? Those are policy questions uh, that I think we'll be able to talk a little bit about here. Um, and then finally, the final big idea, the final big thing we learned after we, we kind of studied this in the 2025 timeframe is we need culture change. And that was one of the very first things that was talked about here today. We need, we need an understanding, a common understanding of the threat, the, the vulnerabilities of our homeland, and that the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. So we worked on that. We worked on that for a while, in and out of the building. Um, and, uh, and about the time the new administration came in, um, uh, and was really starting to get underneath their feet, we, it's about the time we were also starting to look at that next time epic. We were going to do a deep dive into the 2030 uh, time epic. Um, obviously, a new administration comes new policy. So as you're, many of you, I'm sure, are aware, new MDR, new NPR, new NDS. And so we had to kind of update both the previous epic and this epoch, if you will, for the administration and the policy that they were going to set. And uh, you know, I'm happy to, happy to say that uh, this, this administration has gone a long way in that and has really helped us as we be, get ready to take that next step of designing uh, defense design as uh, CSIS showed today. Other things that happened, um, integrated deterrence obviously came in with the new uh, administration, so we had to think, deep, think deeply about that. What does that mean for homeland defense? Um, and it's already been alluded to today, but this balance between um, deterrence by cost imposition and deterrence by denial, right? And so we in the Homeland Defense realm see ourselves in the deterrence by denial uh, business and, and, and improving integrated deterrence in that way. But even inside inter deterrence by denial, you need to think there's another balance inside there that, that you need to think about, and that is denial by defense and denial by resilience. Um, so denial by resilience is you will not achieve your objective because whatever you strike in the homeland is so resilient, it's redundant, it's hardened, it's whatever it is uh, um, that it, um, you, won't, you won't achieve your, thing, your objectives. And then after all those kind of discussions and, and um, uh, scoping, if you will, of the problem, we in NORD and NORTHCOM get to denial by defense, which was the topic of, uh, of what we talked about today. Again, it's hard to go into details of the specific conclusions that we come to because uh, I don't want to give any impression that, first off, we did not participate in this, in this very detailed report. Well, we have done this level of detail as well. Um, but let me say a couple of things about what it takes, what, where we have to go now. Where we have to go now with this, let's just say we had this level of detail that um, uh, it's within the department or, or through policy or whatever. These types of things now that we have to do, and this is the first thing the commander said to me when I briefed him, the 2030 time epic was, all right, Dino, that's my call sign like nomads. Dino, it's time to go out and defend the design. You've created the design. This is the way, we, this is the way that, uh, um, that we propose to, to defend the nation in these types of regards. Go out and engage key stakeholders and defend the design. So what does that mean? So the next steps as we think going forward is, first off, modeling and simulation. It's great to think about a whole lot of capabilities. You know, you, we can all sit here and list um, a whole bunch of interceptors, uh, effectors, if you will, a whole bunch of sensors, and a whole bunch of C2 systems. Um, but if you don't have the data behind it uh, to defend what it is, the architecture that you're trying to build, um, then, then you, uh, you really don't have a defendable design. Um, and, and here, in this regard, we have been partnering, um, NORD and NORTHCOM has been partnering with a lot of people. Uh, MIT Lincoln Labs has helped us with a lot of this, the FFRDCs, MITRE, and of course the rest of the department. 
Uh, MDA has an extensive uh, uh, modeling and SIM capability uh, that we've ledger leveraged as well as the services. Uh, the next thing or another thing you need to do as you think about defending a design like this uh, is experimentation, right? It's not enough to just say my computer crunched the numbers, buy me these capabilities. Uh, you know, you have to, you have to demonstrate those capabilities. And again, here, we don't have those capability, capability to do that inside NORD and NORTHCOM. And we've partnered with many of the people here on the stage to include MDA uh, for some of the uh, experimentation that we've done with uh, combinations of effectors and sensors uh, and even C2 and uh, integrated fire control systems. We've also partnered with the joint staff in a lot of this and some things, uh, Tony is here for us, can probably talk about it, uh, things they call nimble fire and other types of exercises in which we go out and we try to, we try to get the data behind all this. And then finally, war gaming, right? Uh, you've got the data, you've got the experimentation, and now you're ready to war game it and to exercise it. Um, and in this regard, we had a very deliberate process that we went through as we, as we thought about, particularly the 2030 time epic. It started with that sprint, which produced a white paper uh, that, that, we, that we used to kind of, um, uh, to again, bring substance to it. That white paper was the basis of a war game that we played in NORAD and NORTHCOM called uh, Vista Rampart that we played in uh, early March uh, into... Um, April, and we refined this homeland defense design that we built, and we took it outside the headquarters to a, uh, a, a war game called Globally Integrated War Game, which was just recently uh, uh, conducted, and, uh, and, and we brought those concepts to the war game, and we, we war game them at a broader level with the other service, or with the other combatant commands, as well as uh, that. Okay, there's still more parts that you, we have to do to, make, to turn this uh, a defense design like the one that was briefed today uh, into a reality, and that is the organized, train, and equip piece of this. Um, excellent discussion today about the, um, the types of capabilities that we would need, but we also have to remember that some service has to man that, uh, right? Some service has to build an organization uh, to uh, and if it's the Air Force, then, you know, and which I'm familiar with, there's got to be a wing, which means you've got to have a wing commander, right, or a traditional way of thinking. Um, there's got to be a training, you know, so there's your structure all the way down to a squadron. There has to be a training uh, infrastructure that goes all around that. Um, and, um, uh, and, of course, you know, it has to, th these types of concepts have to get into education and the other pieces of it. Um, so, uh, and then finally, if you really want to do this right and you really want to do it on a global scale, you have to at some point integrate your homeland defense design, um, whether it be for cruise missiles or for the broader, with your partners and allies that you expect to fight with in the future. Um, so, in our case, we have a built-in partner uh, for NORAD, the Binational Command uh, with, with Canada that we have. So we, I guess I'll say it this way, when we think about homeland defense, um, uh, defending the homeland, we actually think of defending the homelands with an S. Uh, immediately for us, it's Canada and the United States, but again, to this idea of a successful homeland defense design that you want to integrate globally, you need to bring in your other partners in whatever conflict that you think, so that you don't, one, um, uh, so that you get synergistic effects, right? There are things that maybe one of our partners like Australia can do uh, in a forward, conflict uh, from a homeland defense perspective that, uh, that would be complementary to us, and there's things that we could do to complement theirs. So um, with that, I think I'll turn it over. I probably went over my time, but happy to discuss, to the extent that I can, any specifics on, uh, or try to discuss any, any more specifics on our homeland defense design. But hopefully that process that we've already gone through uh, will help you kind of understand uh, the way we think about it. And then some of those guideposts that I've put out for how we need to move forward will also help as we, uh, as we um, re refine and perfect uh, this idea of cruise missile defense of the homelands. Thank you. Okay. All right. I guess, I guess I'm up next. Uh, so uh, 
First, I want to thank uh, uh, you guys for inviting me to participate in uh, this event today and on this August panel. I, I know all these guys, and it, it's awesome to be up here with, with you and talking about this today. And let me talk about some of those critical missile defense issues that are, that, and challenges that we face today. You know, our vision at the Missile Defense Agency is to earn our nation's confidence uh, by developing an, an effective homeland and regional ballistic uh, missile defense capabilities. So whenever I talk about uh, what we do over at the Missile Defense Agency, I always start with a threat. You know, our, our adversaries are fielding diverse, expansive ranges of modern offensive uh, missile systems, and we see them, we see them in the news every day. Uh, they're developing new missiles and improving existing systems. These systems have uh, increased uh, precision strike capability. They have penetration aids like decoys and jamming. They're capable of maneuvering in the mid-course and the terminal phases of their flight, like maneuvering reentry vehicles, multiple independent reentry vehicles, hypersonic glide vehicles, and cruise missiles. We see that right now, and the, the, these threats are, you know, uh, just getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, these these thre threats are flying further. Uh, they're they're more complicated to track. And they're, they're not just, they're really just not ballistic anymore. The threats that we're facing are just not ballistic anymore. Uh, and so I, I think our, our, our competitors, our adversaries, believe that these threats are an asymmetric advantage that they, that they have. And, and we know that they're trying to use their systems in more complex combinations of, and ways to avoid our defensive capabilities. So the mission of the Missile Defense Agency is, is to defend the United States, our deployed forces, our allies, our friends, against from missile attacks in all phases of flight. And the, and the primary focus of the Missile Defense Agency remains homeland defense. You know, our job is to protect the U.S. from ballistic missile attacks from rogue nations, as well as uh, our forces from regional threats. However, as I already mentioned, the threats continue to evolve. So we're, we're working to evolve and continue to improve our ability to detect, control, and engage uh, these kind of threats against uh, the U.S., our friends, our allies, and our, our forces overseas. Now, if you, if you go back and look at how we got involved in, in, in this topic, this discussion, cruise missile defense of the homeland, we go back uh, basically to a number of uh, missile defense executive board meetings that took place in, in the 2019 time frame. Um, <clears throat> during that time, uh, we were asked and we took the initiative to work with NORAD and North, NORTHCOM to evaluate uh, architecture options to focus that focused on homeland cruise missile defense. That's 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 really what we were doing. Nord Northcom, as as uh, as uh, General Murray was talking, is is concerned about potential adversaries using conventional uh, cruise missiles to attack critical targets uh, in the homeland. And and so uh, we felt that we had a new capability that we could help them uh, as they started as they're trying to look through that problem. So the MDEV asked the, the Missile Defense Agency to work with Nord, NORTHCOM to be in system engineering and architecture analysis for Homeland Cruise Missile Defense. Uh, <clears throat> given our background, MDA is uniquely postured uh, to support this joint cruise missile defense of the Homeland effort. Uh, we put together joint capabilities to do missile defense already, and that's, that, that's, that's where we come from. And we look at, we look at the, the, those kind of architectures from a, from a joint perspective. So MDA has worked closely with NORAD and NORTHCOM to connect cruise missile defense of the Homeland kill chain analysis, technical architecture development, and specifically, we've been working with NORAD and NORTHCOM uh, to develop uh, system architectures that integrate existing service capabilities and new technologies across the kill chain uh, from domain awareness, detect, uh, information dominance, control, and decision superiority engage uh, to defeat mechanisms to be able to handle these threats. Now, MDA uh, has met with North NORTHCOM representatives uh, a lot. I mean, we, 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 I think we have a really good uh, relationship with NORA and NORTHCOM, making sure that we understand what their requirements are and what they're, what they're looking for, and to discuss that overall architecture that they're kind of looking at and what our architecture approach, analysis approach should be. We analyze on multiple architectures, looking at capabilities to identify risk, developing initial cost estimates to support any, of the, any department budgeting process if, if we were decided to go look further into that. We're working with NORAD NORTHCOM and the Air Force in developing the initial government reference uh, concepts for the over-the-horizon radar capabilities that we're looking at for that, for that domain awareness and uh, information superiority. MDA's uh, performed initial uh, sensor and weapon coverage analysis for cruise missile defense of the homeland in, uh, in a limited uh, defense role uh, that 
for Northrop's preferred uh, uh, proposed uh, defended assets. We, 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 we've worked with them to say, where are, are places that you think that we should be looking at defending so that we could look at how you would put a defended capability in those areas. Uh, we, we, and we continue to work with the community on, on additional iterations of sensor and wep weapons laydowns and, and in close coordination with Nora and Northcom and, and the department to make sure that we're, that we're looking at all the capabilities and doing a, a good job at trying to evaluate those. The results of these could be used to determine weapons mix and s sensor types and, and weapon types that could be used uh, with cost uh, analysis and support uh, the definition of this limited area defense capability architectures to support the defense of those critical assets. So we've that, that, that kind of architecture work is continuing and it's, and it's there and it's ready to support the department as it, as it looks at this uh, critical issue. In addition to the architecture work, MDA was a, a task also to conduct some live virtual uh, demonstrations using uh, joint tactical integrated fire control capability to leverage uh, capabilities that we've seen in existing demos and and, uh, and work to integrate capabilities together to provide an enhanced capability uh, to defend the homeland from cruise missiles. So in the end, MDA is looking to aid in the development of more integrated joint architectures that enable the warfighter to better command and control uh, the system in order to use the right sensors paired with the right uh, capability engaging at the right threat at the right time. And, and with that, I'll close my comments and pass it to the next. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I, I want to start by thanking uh, Jen, you personally, for, for being here and for moderating today. Also, Tom and the team uh, for inviting all of us. We are all actually teammates. We have been working together quite a bit just in the recent months on this very problem. Uh, and um, much of what you're going to hear from, I think, all of us uh, is going to be uh, somewhat repetitive, um, but from our various uh, perspectives. Uh, but, uh, but again, to Jen and Tom, um, your, your analysis and your many, uh, many works of, of, of articles and, and studies uh, and the re research that you do and the interviews that you do, they highlight the complexity uh, and the challenging role of integrated air and missile defense. Uh, certain, uh, it's certain to me uh, that without such articles or, or the report that, uh, that you all reviewed today, uh, that uh, IAMD missions and the resources required to perform those missions uh, and sustain them would not uh, probably come about, um, at least not, not to the level that we, uh, we need as a nation. I also appreciate your work because uh, you offer opportunities for uh, us to look at the problems in different ways and for us to see ourselves and, uh, and to, uh, to ensure we're doing right uh, by the citizens of our nation. I'm honored to be included among some of the great and strategic minds of our business uh, in defending the homelands. So let me start uh, by setting your minds at ease. Um, if you were here at the earlier session, uh, I'm, I'm a warrior. So I have no vegetables uh, and uh, I have no Costco trips. Uh, I'll leave that to the wickedly smart team who conducted the valuable research that I think is, uh, is quite useful. Uh, just a bit about me, I've spent about 27 years of my life as an Army Air Defense soldier. I've operated IAMD capabilities in every AOR where IAMD operators are deployed and stationed today. I've fought the, the first Configuration 3 Pack 3 Patriot battery in OIF and employed the first Patriot remote launch capability in early 2003. I don't say that uh, 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 for any other reason than to give you the context of the lens that I look through, and that's the eyes of an operator on the ground uh, who volunteers to put their life at risk for uh, the defense of our nation. I've spent the last seven years directly involved in the sustainment and modernization of our IAMD force, where I've finally landed on the Joint Staff. JIMDO, the Joint Integrated Air Missile Defense Organization, uh, on the joint staff under the J-8, serves as the, as the Chairman's IAMD Mission Manager and Subject Matter Expert on behalf of the Joint IAMD Force. JIMDO has five critical functions. First, concept development. How we fight in joint multi-domain operating environments by applying and refining the principles of IAMD. 
analysis and experimentation. How can we fight better and what do we need in terms of capability to support our national strategies? What capabilities prove stronger? What capacity is necessary? How do we integrate and converge multi-service capabilities to achieve strategic and operational advantage over our adversaries? Third, requirements development. Understanding the combatant commander's needs and developing sound requirements that are prioritized across the entire IAMD enterprise. These requirements become the basis for proposed solutions. Fourth, Capability development. Jamdo applies a modest budget to the development of promising technologies that we later hand off to an interested service with the Title X authority to further develop and integrate a capability. And finally, Jamdo is assigned the role of, of advocacy or advocate for the warfighter. The warfighter can be defined in a few ways. Some point solely to the combatant commander. However, we have the task to help balance the capability and capacity across the globe and among missions, IAMD and non-IAMD, and we take all viewpoints into consideration when executing our advocacy role. So in October, the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, or JROC, you may be familiar with, approved the IAMD Capability Portfolio Management Review, CPMR, process. Now, I'll be the first to acknowledge uh, any concerns about bureaucracy. What better way to counter bureaucracy than with a new process. But this is unlike any process I've seen in my almost 30 years as a warrior. This process will enable flexible and a holistic approach to determining and prioritizing IAMD requirements. It established a priority framework that the combatant commands and joint force will help us review annually in developing what we're calling a joint integrated air and missile defense portfolio priority list a holistic approach to the entire IAMD enterprise. This list will assist senior decision makers in balancing budgetary needs and synchronizing cross-service and DOD agency support for vital missions such as air and cruise missile defense of the homelands. In the case of the homelands, interagency policy and support between DOD and non-DOD authorities and even industry and commercial participation will be critical. Defense of the homelands is a is, is critical to our national survival and to enable our global military power projection in order to support any integrated deterrence strategy by imposing great risk to any adversary that would consider attacking the United States. The change in the threat over the last decades is imposing a need to reassess our IAMD priorities. Yes, adversary cruise missiles have improved in range, countermeasures, and lethality but also our adversaries have invested in the development of these threats through hypersonic technology, subsurface maritime capability projection, where cruise missiles can come at the homelands from any direction and across multiple directions simultaneously. They'll likely integrate threat systems with other means of attack that may not be affected by active IAMD capabilities. They will employ space-based targeting, jamming and spoofing technologies, decoy employment, a wide spectrum of threat capabilities that are and will continue to drive up the cost of active, layered, and integrated air missile defense. Simply, our leaders have tough decisions ahead of them as they attempt to balance a fully resourced integrated deterrence and defeat effort. So, assume, for the sake of argument, which is probably not true, that we see no force structure growth and no reduction. In other words, we're not getting larger, we're not getting smaller, which is probably likely not the case. Uh, let's say for the next 10 years, a steady state. We don't get bigger, we don't get smaller, but a conclusion might be that the United States would have to balance the addition of mission with the IAMD of Guam, for example, or other existing IAMD missions and locations around the world to protect our national interests and U.S. forces. So how are we to do that without aligning and prioritizing the entire IAMD enterprise? By applying integrated deterrence and balancing strategic and operational risk. So I want to emphasize a component of capability development that has not gotten a lot of press. Uh, and it uh, doesn't make its way into a lot of discussions. But General Murray did, did, did discuss it. It generally costs more than the defense acquisition of a warfighting battlefield system. 
It's called .mil PFP. It's one of those DOD acronyms that doesn't really even sound like something you'd probably want to talk about. D for doctrine, O for organization, T for training, M for materiel, which is what we talk a lot about, leadership and education, P for personnel, F for facilities, and P for policy. So with that, what is .mil PFP to us? .mil PFP are all of the resources that when combined offer a complete and employable capability. Systems are not the entirety of a capability. You need authorization of a military force structure, which does not come cheap. People are costly. It's costly to recruit, to assess, to educate, to train, to develop those people, to pay their wages, and to care for their families when they willingly risk their lives for liberty. There are costs to training our warriors for a new mission or to develop the doctrine by which they now must fight. There are costs in, in terms of funding time and analysis of a test program or to establish a confidence in a safe and employable capability. There are always facilities to be built. Uh, there are always environmental studies to be completed. Managing the talent and the human resources side of a capability can be extremely challenging for a function that has a very low density of operators, such as integrated air missile defense. How do you provide a trained and ready force and sustain that force for the life of a mission, for years or decades even? While much of the joint force has returned to a steady and predictable deployment schedule after closing operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, this simply is not the case with many of our IAMD forces. If anything, their op tempo and demand continues to increase. This is just one indication of that. In some cases, the IMD force is expanding, but likely not enough uh, for all of these new missions. So let me acknowledge here that these are not new requirements. We've been discussing them for years. We've watched the threat develop, and, we've <clears throat> and our action is necessary to play success in our favor. Analysis from this report uh, that we discussed today, I think, is worth consideration. That's why I'm really encouraged to see that C CSIS has taken on some of, of this in the report, at least by acknowledging a greater cost to any of these types of missions to offer our strategic leaders an opportunity to balance these tough, critical missions. It's something that we're putting greater emphasis on in the JROC as it seeks to meet its Title X responsibilities by validating requirements and determining if recommended solutions will actually meet those requirements. Areas that we see critical to the success of the homelands first include an array of layered fire, fire control sensing capability, whether space, airborne, elevated, or ground capabilities, all are likely necessary. Wide area active and passive sensors to provide a resilient and redundant network. Second, a challenging component of a credible defense capability is the inclusion and mix of kinetic and non-kinetic effectors, interceptors, directed energy, and other technologies that expand our capability to defend strategic assets. Simply put, extravagant missiles are not enough and will not alone protect our national interests. And finally, a term that is, I believe, overused in many ways and at times assumed away, integration. Integration, the ability to share data, is no longer enough to maintain the tactical edge we need. The introduction and application of an optimal, resilient mesh network across the combined and joint force goes beyond data sharing. A joint and integrated fire control capability lays upon our developers to fully open the architecture allowing the command and control platforms that we use across all services to actually control multi-service sensors and effectors. This will reduce the costly C2 footprint and, an, and, and a requirement for operators of multiple C2 platforms. Bridging systems, while an encouraging first step, will not fully introduce a resilient capability. As the JROC continues to balance global requirements in accordance with its Title X responsibilities, it will soon provide guidance on next steps in support of NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM's mission to deter, protect, and defend the homeland. 
General Roper's comments provide us a framework to tackle this difficult problem. It begins with credible global integrated deterrence at home and abroad. The idea of campaigning, as he mentioned, displaying a deterrent effect by improving and maintaining our capability and capacity, resiliency, hardening, and redundancy. Domain awareness globally, sensor to shooter and sensor to decision maker. I submit that by integrating offensive and defensive capabilities and doctrine, enabling the dynamic targeting of multi-domain threats, either left of first launch or using the first launch to target a delivery platform, we can leverage our capabilities in a way that places our adversaries at grave risk. We are pursuing multi-domain A2AD strategies to put adversary actions at risk as they, as they target our interests. We are refining how we fight as a combined and joint force, and we are working to balance the regional and homeland battlefields. In closing, it remains important to remember the warriors who volunteer to serve, to train, and operate in a mission such as these. Cooperation and collaboration between the, the United States and our international partners becomes even more critical to leverage a credible integrated deterrence and defense capability. And lastly, it is true, we cannot afford to do everything, which is why the convergence of systems to, to enable a fully immersive joint multi-domain operating environment is a no-fail mission essential task. I look forward to our discussion today. Thank you very much. Great, I think I'm gonna follow Tony and, and uh, give my remarks uh, up here. First of all, I wanna thank Tom CSIS for inviting me to participate in this panel with a group of uh, incredibly knowledgeable uh, colleagues that I used to formerly work with. And uh, thank Jen Hudson for uh, moderating this. I wanna be clear, these remarks are my own and are not affiliated with any uh, institution uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, that I may that I may be part of. Uh, I think, it, to some extent, and I think Tony may have mentioned it, um, you know, there's a little, you, you may hear s some remarks that, where there's a little bit of uh, overlap, uh, and that may be a good thing. I mean, perhaps, <clears throat> you know, there's a, a embryonic consensus starting to form around this, this issue about sort of the right set of, uh, right set of ideas. The CSIS report, I think, makes a, an important contribution to the dialogue on addressing growing missile threats uh, to the homeland, right? The topic, of, of course, is receiving heightened attention due in no small part to the changes in the strategic environment that raise new questions regarding the policy of defending the homeland against cruise missiles from our strategic competitors, uh, Russia and, and uh, China. I think the report uh, does, does a good job of uh, outlining a framework Right, which uh, takes an approach to CMD, Homeland CMD, that really is different from those considered over, quite frankly, the past 30 years or so. I, I think one way to think about this, and I'm gonna frame it up in, in this following way, is, that, is to look at the old problem that Homeland CMD sought to solve in the past and contrast that with the new problem that CMD seeks uh, to address. Briefly, uh, the old problem. With the exception of minimal air defense in the national commander region, national command region, sort of arising from uh, concerns about another 9-11 type attack, uh, the United States throughout most of the post-Cold War period assessed that the risk of cruise missile strikes against the homeland from large powers did not warrant establishing a policy that would in turn drive new programs, capabilities, and resources supporting a more expansive national cruise missile defense capability. This view was clearly anchored in the judgments over the past three decades that the prospect of a Chinese or nuclear cruise missile strike that occurred apart from a wider nuclear attack on the United States was low and therefore uh, strategic nuclear deterrence was deemed uh, uh, sufficient. There were a num number of other related considerations associated with CMDH during the Cold War period that tended to inhibit progress on this matter. First was cost. If enemy cruise missile strikes were to be part of a broader strategic attack on the United States, and this likely employed in, ex in extraordinarily large numbers, this would drive up right, CMD architectural and system requirements. If the United States needed to cover 
large numbers of assets in the homeland with large numbers of air defense sites and systems, the cost would be substantial. Uh, CMDH studies conducted throughout the 1990s and 2000s over about a 20 year period, uh, you know, suggested, uh, suggested as much. There was also an, an interesting political issue that, that, that sort of uh, inhibited, I think, progress in the past three decades on this. Throughout this time frame, the issue of what should be defended remained largely unsettled. Should CMD protect military targets? Should it protect nuclear command control communication? Should it protect leadership? Should it protect populations? Should it protect a little bit of each? Should it protect all? Uh, those were the questions that were dealt with for, for several uh, decades. Perhaps most importantly, the question of protecting population centers was bedeviled by insol insolvable debates over which population centers should be protected. Due to the political difficulty of prioritizing which population centers within the U.S. should or would be protected, and those you know, which uh, should be not, the discussion over during the time right, the Department of Defense looked at these issues in the 1990s and beyond often defaulted to a position of examining CMD for the United States on a wide area or territorial basis. Again, the notional CMD architectures turned out to be prohibitively costly. So overall, the absence of a clear and compelling threat combined with ill-defined policy on what CMD should defend and why, including how it related to U.S. homeland defense and deterrence objectives, contributed really to a lack of progress on this matter for about three decades. So what's the new problem? Let's turn to that, because I think the CSI, CSIS report kind of begins to get at this. With regard to CMDH today, I think it's important to recognize changes are occurring that present a new strategic context, right? A new set of issues different from the all unresolved debates of the, of the past. The most consequential of these is highlighted in the 2022 National Defense Strategy Fact Sheet, which the administration released uh, a number of months ago, which calls attention to this new context. <clears throat> Quote, recognizing growing kinetic and non-kinetic threats to the United States homeland from our strategic competitors, the department will take necessary actions to increase resi resi excuse me, resiliency our ability to withstand, fight through, and recover quickly from disruption, end of quote, right? The NDS 2022 fact sheet. Very important statement, I mean, in my judgment. One particularly significant development related to, quote, unquote, the growing kinetic threats is Russia and China's pursuit of advanced long-range cruise missiles, right? We've heard about this uh, almost in every panel and, and, and in the report and from uh, our colleagues both now and, uh, and, and earlier. Um, Right, these can be launched from air and sea to hold at risk targets within the United States, essential to its ability to project conventional power into Europe and the Indo-Pacific region to support our overseas military operations and alliance security commitments. A long-standing American operating model predicated on the uninter uninterrupted flow of forces from a secure and uncontested homeland in order to allow the U.S. to rapidly intervene in a crisis or conflict appears to be uh, eroding. Right? Russia and China are extending their, their anti-access and area denial missile strike capabilities, which are familiar with in the regional context. Right? They're beginning to extend those to the US, uh, the US homeland. This development provides them opportunities to conduct comparatively, comparatively small or limited conventional strikes against the homeland below the threshold of nuclear weapons use. And we've heard that, I think, mentioned at least a couple of times. The objective of these attacks, possibly delivered in conjunction with other non-nuclear strategic attacks, uh, either arising from counter space or cyber, would be to erode both American political resolve and its military capacity necessary to respond or halt aggression in a regional conflict. Such attacks may in fact be a precondition for Russia and China in order to secure a local regional military uh, victory. In light of these evolving strategic vulnerabilities to the homeland, it seems prudent and timely to re-examine and, and reframe CMDH efforts so that they are better aligned to deterring and defending against limited kinetic strikes uh, directed at degrading American power, power projection. The focus of a CMD strategy should be clear on what we are defending and why. What do we need to protect to get our forces forward that can be crippled kinematically, uh, or excuse me, kinetically, by conventional cruise missile attack in numbers that could be reasonably launched from sea-based or air-based platforms. Tailoring CMD to the particular goals and objectives 
of our opponent, uh, that our opponents seek in carrying out such limited threats, I think creates a different context for the discussion over the scope and scale of CMDH. This approach probably rules out large or larger territorial-wide requirements. Rather, the goal would be to, to preserve power projection capabilities, as we've heard, right, from kinetic interference by limiting damage to critical military facilities and transportation hubs and possibly command and control nodes. This is probably essential if we are to credibly contemplate projecting military power across oceans to engage great power rivals on their doorstep. With this con uh, within this context, the prospective deterrence and defense contributions of CMDH would be clear. First, to strengthen deterrence of limited attacks by degrading and complicating our opponent's offensive missile uh, A2AD campaign plans, in turn eroding confidence in the success successful execution of those plans. And second, if deterrence fails, contain, contain the scope and damage or the scope and scale of damage to critical power projection assets sufficient to carry out those features of our conventional military plans flowing from the homeland. Orienting CMDH around these deterrence and defense goals could provide additional benefits that impeded previous discussions over how to proceed. First, by focusing CMDH around the defense of, comparati of a comparatively narrow set of assets to enable the flow of general purpose forces from the homeland opens up the possibility of steering clear of the quite frankly, paralyzing political debates over you know, city or regional defenses uh, that, that plagued this discussion uh, in, in the past. Second, CMD fo CMDH focused along these lines provides clear limits on the scope and scale of the defense objectives in making explicit that the purpose of defense is not to chase the, is not to chase the cruise missile threat or to protect every rock across uh, the nation. Again, another attribute that doomed right, the discussion of Homeland CMD for almost, almost 30 years. Um, uh, you know, under these conditions, CMDH operates within a broader framework that integrates the tools, capabilities, and forces needed to deter, withstand, and fight through Russian and Chinese growing capacity to threaten this type of limited warfare against the United States. To wrap up, while important questions will have to be addressed over the particular details and attributes of Homeland CMD, and the CSIS study provides us, I think, good food for thought you know, on this question. It seems to me the benefits of some defense capability here to deny Russia and China an unchallenged pathway to threaten the United States would appear to be uh, compelling. Thanks. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Thank you so much uh, for your very thorough remarks. Um, so we're going to dive into questions. And if anyone has a question who's sitting in the audience, um, if you go on to the CSIS website, um, to the vent page, there's a button there that you can click on to ask a question. We won't be taking questions from the audience uh, via microphone. So please feel free to submit. I'm receiving them right here, hopefully, <laughs> if everything works as planned. Uh, I wanted to jump, just jump in and, and ask, you know, why is the government just beginning to really seriously address cruise missile defense of the homeland? I mean, there's been attempts, to, attempts in the past. This has been identified in the MDR as a necessity. Um, and it sounds like, based on your remarks, General Murray, that you are getting close to having somewhat of a, an idea on your architecture, potentially, that you're now going to be wargaming, et cetera. Uh, so talk about first why it is that we're, what's lighting the fire now? And then kind of where you are a little bit more in detail. Anyone can jump in on the first half of that question. <laughs> okay, I, I guess I'll, I guess I'll, uh, I'll start. So first, like I said in my comments, it's a very complex problem. Um, my first observation would be that, um, that I think that the, the department and, and our partners have been studying this problem for a long time. Um, and there have, been, there have been challenges associated with uh, the resources involved in something like this, as well as some of the stuff that I talked about earlier is our, our forces aren't necessarily uh, structured to do something like this, um, or at least haven't been for some time. Uh, where uh, where uh, some time ago we, we used to have, uh, for example, Nike Hercules batteries uh, on you know at various different sites in the U.S. and those types of things. We're now we've been structured for a long time and focused abroad 
for a long time. And, um, and so now as we really start to look at this problem, and, and I think we see the, the, the weight of the threat and the concern of that threat, and now even uh, uh, to even more recent uh, you know, observations of the willingness to actually put that threat into action is what's really kind of causing us to, uh, to gravitate towards, towards some action here. But there is still a lot in terms of you know, how, do we, how do we actually resource this um, and how do we how do we balance it among you know uh, a homeland defense um, you know a home game vice and away game uh, per se and, and and how do you how do you go about making sure that we're not you know taking undue risk in other areas that quite frankly could impact the homeland just as just as gravely as as if we don't do something in the homeland so that's I think that's part of it uh, I think the other part of it is um, we're, we're 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 seeing you know the um, the, the, the national strategy kind of drive us in this direction, which I think is very helpful as well. Yeah, I would just, I would just add that I think uh, Pepe had a great point about and, 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 and laid out what has paralyzed this debate in the past. Um, but as far as why, I'd, why I think we're at a, a place uh, where we're, we're more open to looking at it is the confluence of the things that you talked about, uh, but also the adversary gets a vote, right? So, so uh, it's actually only in these past, let's just say five, six, a uh, few years, that we have seen our adversaries build the capabilities to actually deliver a conventional munition to, uh, and 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 demonstrate those capabilities. So that I think has also put a sense of urgency in this, um, in, a, in addition to the. Um, what's been mentioned before. In the past, it was basically just maybe a, a one or two type of capabilities that would be delivered from one adversary, perhaps Russia. Now we see um, a multitude of capabilities to deliver from multitudes of, of um, weapons platforms, from multitudes of domains to include space. Okay, and you, you also mentioned, you know, you have a sense of where you need to go, and you talked about getting to 2030. Um, does that mean that we have the potential to see a big ramp up in funding in the base budget request in 24? I know that's just you're just beginning the cycle there, um, but you know, what's what's on the table? What has to happen? Do you need to have exponentially more funding next year and in the following years than you've applied in FY23, which really wasn't all that much um, when you lump in Guam um, and what you're doing there? Potentially that adds in. Um, but talk to me about what needs to happen if you're looking at getting at more robust uh, cruise missile defense capability for the homeland by 2030. Yeah, there's certainly a funding piece to this uh, and a policy decision to fund. Uh, but at the same time, we also need a lead organization, as we alluded to earlier, to drive this, uh, to drive this effort forward. Because... Um, uh, all of the services care about this. All the services are building capabilities uh, that could be used in this space. Uh, what we need is one lead organization to bring those together to build the architecture and, uh, and, to, and to drive the program forward. Okay, um, you, you alluded to, I think, something that's kind of been a standing request uh, for a while within the NDAA and also uh, within the MDR to uh, identify an acquisition authority for this uh, particular mission. Um, can you say potentially how close you all are in making a decision on who's going to take ownership for this? That would likely need to happen soon, I would think. <laughs> I'm not going to try to predict uh, the uh, the processes that are in, say, but I will say that they're, they're, the department is is taking this very seriously and has plans, in fact, uh, and, and and is meeting almost as we speak to make this decision. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask all of you uh, what you felt was the strongest point in the report that has come out uh, from CSIS today, um, but what you still feel needs uh, some more development in terms of, uh, you know, I think, logistics and, and also manning is something that was mentioned here. So if you can unravel that a little bit more, um, I, that's open to anybody here. I'll let you decide who wants to jump in. Yeah, so from my, from my perspective, the, the strongest point was in the report was the, the look at the systems and the capabilities that you need to include to try to look at this, kind of look at it a layered capability 
uh, to be able to handle those kind of threats. I think, I, I think uh, uh, as mentioned uh, before, the, where, where it's easy to throw the capabilities out, it's then how do you employ those capabilities, how you man those capabilities. I, I think those are, those are those things that you still, need to, you still need to look at as when you go through this. But, but again, you need to start with something. And so being able to start with a, with a capability and to look at that and say, how, how, do, how can I defend against these kind of threats? And then move to that, those, those other more detailed questions. I think that's, that, from my perspective, that, that was, was well and short in the report. Uh, from my perspective, if somebody's, if somebody's spent 30 years uh, working sort of defense strategy issues, the recognition of the changes in the nature of adversaries sort of war fighting capabilities, the, the move towards uh, limited, war, limited warfare concepts, right, to undermine American conventional superiority uh, attributes, right, and the way they may get around to, to do this, I thought was an important uh, contribution to, to the discussion to help sort of shift our thinking, as my, my comments noted, from getting away from the old problem to focus on, on the new problem. The challenge will be, uh, you know, the, the good side, the, the, the downside, the challenge will be, writ large, is continuing to calibrate Homeland Cruise Missile Defense in a way that doesn't bring us down a path of where we've been for the past 30 years, right? That there isn't mission creep, that we don't continue to expand what we what we want from Homeland Cruise Missile Defense in ways that will sort of undermine the chance of any consensus being built around it. This Homeland CMD has to be tailored around the specific objectives that our adversaries seek in right, carrying out these attacks against the United States. And we've got to, keep, we've got to stay on, on point on, on, on that regard or else we're going to repeat uh, the, the past mistakes of uh, three decades and I think end up with nothing. Okay, anyone else? So, you know, I would say what, what I was really pleased to see is, is the, the, the amount of thought that went into the, 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 the sensing and, and layered capability in terms of sensors, not just ground sensors, not just space sensors, but elevated sensors, um, but even, even higher elevated sensors. I mean, you need that layered, resilient kind of capability, uh, I think, to start. Um, and uh, and again, I was I was pleased and encouraged to see you know some some uh, some thought put into the operational and sustainment cost of such of a mission. Um, there are two things uh, that I think going forward, uh, you know, probably still requires more more consideration. One is, um, you know, once you really put those capabilities in place, it kind of goes back to that command and control. Um, uh, uh, capability and one of the areas that we've seen from a .mil PFP perspective that that is really driving up the resource needs on a lot of these missions is that you have let's just say in this particular case you have um, you have Army capability and you have Navy capability maybe you'll have some Air Force capability too but probably in a different you know different serving in a different capacity but in terms of IAMD let's just say Army and Navy but yet you still have to work through the integration or convergence of those 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 cap capabilities because I think that that's what will allow us to synchronize the .mil PFP issues and resources necessary. If we don't do that synchronization up front, then uh, we're really kind of taking ourselves down a road where we're going to grow uh, the mission to something that might not be sustainable. And so we just have to really work through that. Um, and uh, and sometimes I get a lot of comments that I talk about .mil PFP too much, but but you know I'm passionate about it because. Uh, because I've been on the receiving side of, of, of those, you know, decisions, and uh, many of us have. And, um, and we kind of see where that takes us if, if we're not careful about it, and we don't have people really thinking through that and trying to synchronize those. Two quick uh, things that I took uh, that I thought were, were great about it. One of the, is the set of principles. Um, you know, be, being a concepts guy, I, I really like those set of principles that, that allow you to kind of take the next step. The second would be the tailorability of this. We can all, we could all sit down and believe me, the, we've done it, the permutations are endless. Sit down and say, I'm gonna put this there, that there, this there, that there. But really that's a policy decision on where we, where we set that dial. How much risk we're willing to take and how much, um, how much we want to defend individual given areas. But if you can build a construct that's tailorable uh, to that risk, that policy decision, then you're not stuck with 
you get what you get and you don't throw a fit, which I tell my kids. So, thanks. All right, uh, I wanted to ask about Guam. Uh, I think that there are potential lessons learned from Guam that you could apply to homeland defense, cruise missile defense of the homeland. Uh, however, Guam is just in the form of now a defined architecture. It's not been implemented. I'm sure there'll be far more lessons learned as you move forward. But uh, what are you hoping uh, you can apply from Guam um, when you consider cruise missile defense for the homeland? And what just isn't going to be applicable for coming from Guam? Um, so so when, when you look at the, the, the Guam problem set, it, it's really a multi-missile uh, uh, defense problem set. It's, it started with ballistic, hypersonic cruise missiles. How do I defend the island, that critical, that critical island against those kind of threats? And so when we, as we started looking at that, how do, you, how, do you, how do you bring capabilities together and, and, and join them together, integrate them, so that you can have an integrated defense against those type of, all those type of threats? Because it, really, the, as you look at those threats, they're kind of individu have been individually looked at. So how do you bring that capability together? I, I think as, as, we, as we develop the Guam architecture, uh, working with the Army, working with the Navy, working with the Joint Staff and the services, I think we'll learn a lot from that of, of how we want to operate that integrated kind of defense and that you know that area is 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 kind of the size of what you're looking at it and trying to defend say a limited area in the conus now you wouldn't need all that capability because you certainly uh here we're looking at cruise missile defense on the homeland you don't but you but but you could bring those lessons in and hopefully be able to bring capabilities in if you need more capability in, in that that and i think that's where guam comes in Okay. And anyone else want to comment? All right. <laughs> um, I wanted to also ask, in terms of what industry can help you with now, I mean, we're talking a lot about using things that are already developed, already in the inventory in some ways, um, radars from other interagency sharing of data um, and sensors. Um, but where can industry really help fill in some of the gaps um, in order to create some kind of architecture for cruise missile defense in the homeland that may not be fleshed out yet? Where are you hoping to see industry work? From my perspective, uh, as you said, there, there, there's, there's a lot of capability out there. And, and all the services have developed capabilities to defend against cruise missiles. They've, they've got capabilities, that point defense capability to defend against uh, cruise missile uh, threats. There's sensors, there's there, there are command and control systems, there's, there's effectors that, that are looking at that. And, but as we look at this and trying to get the best capabilities, how do you combine those together and so that they operate together? And I think that's kind of where I think we would like to probably see more industry help on that is how do you how do you do that because a lot of these capabilities are also dip, made by different industry partners and so how do you how do you integrate different industry partners assets together to do that because it's you know a lot of times it's the keys to the kingdom are you know those algorithms and those 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 things that are done inside the the fire control capabilities of those systems uh, to, to be able to operate so how do we how do we better integrate them across and I think that's that's where I, I would see a lot from industry. You know, so as a capability manager for the last few years, what, what I'm seeing that's extremely encouraging is the cooperation among industry partners. That's something, um, it's not new, but it certainly, I think, has increased um, uh, on, on, on their side. What helps us now from, a, from the aspect of building requirements is sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And we don't know what might be the best way to do something. And so our industry partners are, are putting a lot of investment into solving a lot of these problems that they see and that they know that we have. And, uh, and so our engagement with them is very important to help us understand really what those problems are and what the possibilities of technology might bring us. Uh, then, then that allows us to kind of build requirements associated with you know, how do we actually solve that problem. And so that's been very helpful too. And I think that as long as we continue to, uh, to encourage that, that's, uh, that's something that, uh, that I've seen that has been very useful. The piece that I would add is um, automation. Uh, really bring in the AI and the ML into this piece because as you've probably heard today, uh, the dot mil PF piece, if you will, the Manning piece, in a zero sum um, uh, world of Manning, we have to find ways to do this less, less manpower intensive, um, but yet still have the reliability that our decision makers expect of us when we're talking about 
uh, de defending the homeland uh, from a cruise missile and making sure one of the reasons that, that it is very manpower intensive right now is that nobody wants to shoot down an airline, and rightfully so. So how do we bring in AI and ML, but yet still be, have the uh, predictability and the reliability that will, that will give us our leaders the confidence that we can employ these systems? Okay. I wanted to also follow up on uh, something Colonel Barron's mentioned about priority list for um, air and missile defense as, as well as cruise missile defense, kind of the whole portfolio, if you will. Um, now, I care about this as a journalist. Are we going to see this in a public way? Um, and how are you going to be sort of unveiling or coming out with a priority list in a public way, if at all? We're probably not going to do it here at CIS. Not today. <laughs> but uh, um, so I, I think what we'll see is uh, th this is our first attempt at it. So for many, many uh, years, decades even, U.S. Stratcom has has really held the uh, the responsibility of a missile defense integrated priority list. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's on testing, testing. Anybody? <laughs> okay. I'll keep talking just in case. It's Here, on. just pass a new one. There we go. Maybe, or maybe it's just... Maybe it's just you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's just switching off in front of me. Is it all the... <laughs> I, think, I think it must be me. Okay, so um, uh, this is what integration gets us. So, <laughs> so, uh, um, so as we have started the work of transitioning that responsibility to the joint staff, JIMDO will, will do the, you know, the kind of the coordination of that work, but it's not a solely a joint staff mission or a joint st or, or a JIMDO mission. Uh, we've recently brought the uh, represent representatives from each of the combatant commands, all 11 combatant commands, uh, to, uh, to the area to start to help us work through the methodology. We want to make sure we get that methodology correct and, and in a way that will allow us to ensure that we're, we're seeing and we're waiting the voice of the combatant commanders in terms of what they need operationally. And so the more um, combatant commanders who ask for the same things, then you'll start to see that capability requirement you know, kind of move its way up on the list. Um, because we don't want to lose sight of what is really necessary for a campaign to be successful. Uh, through the eyes of a combatant commander. Uh, and so uh, we're working towards that methodology now. Starting in, uh, in one October uh, time frame, we'll start the actual work of then bringing everyone together to start to build this uh, consolidated IAMD enterprise list. So before where the missile defense um, uh, aspect of, of the list uh, was really for missile defense capabilities and nothing else, uh, while they were mentioned and they were accepted and they were understood what those, those requirements were. Uh, they weren't necessarily tied to resourcing uh, or to a priority or integrated. And so what you'll see um, uh, about the March time frame is when we're, 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 we think we're going to be able to, to push this first list out um, is a full spectrum of IMD capability requirements. Uh, whether it's counter UAS requirements or it's defense against hypersonics requirements, but it's largely going to depend on what those combatant commanders say that they need that year uh, to, to build that prioritization. From there on out, it probably, you know, will be tweaking that list more so than rebuilding it every single year, uh, but it is going to be an annual effort. Um, in terms of your question of, of, you know, will it be a fully public release or, you know, uh, I think there will be different aspects of it, right? And so we may be able to provide some categorization of what, uh, what the department is recommending in terms of prioritization. Uh, obviously, we'll, we'll want to keep close hold the, you know, the, the, the true capability requirements that are going to drive capability development and resourcing uh, into the future and, 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 and allow Congress the time that it needs to, you know, assess that, that, that prioritization and determine what's important. Absolutely. Um, I'm just going to ask one question from the audience. I know we're basically out of time. Um, this comes from Arch Macy. Uh, what capabilities are being considered to deal with potential internal threats in the U.S., i.e. commercial or private aircraft used in a 9-11 scenario? Just to close. <laughs> Who wants to take that one? <laughs> He's throwing the microphone back at you. <laughs> you can take mine. Capabilities, yeah. Well, first off, 
let me say that this remains the counter VEO threat, uh, preventing another 9-11 remains the, a top priority of the, of the command. So even though we recognize the, uh, the growing peer threat, uh, we, we, we are still also laser focused on that piece of the threat. Um, so I can't, I can't talk about specifics, but I will say this, we are constantly continue to uh, upgrade our capability to uh, counter and defeat that, uh, that threat whether it be with um, material solutions, i.e. Uh, could, it could be missiles, it could be whatever, and, or, and with um, non-material solutions like new and updated um, tactics, techniques, and procedures, but it remains a, 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 seri um, a, a primary focus of ours. Well, with that, we are out of time. I wish we had another couple of hours. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for uh, sitting in the hot seat here uh, for the last hour or so. And thank you also to CSIS and to Tom uh, Carica for uh, rolling out this really interesting report today. And we'll turn it over to Tom. Well, thank you, Jen. Uh, we really do have a significant uh, fraction of the nation's brain power on these issues here. Thank you all, gentlemen, for coming out. I think we might have to update our report. The microphone issue uh, will require us an, an eighth principle of redundancy and resilience, but we, you man, managed to make it through. Uh, thanks again. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll come back for our last panel on, uh, on with defense industry. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>
All right, well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, again, I'm Tom Carrico from CSIS. Uh, this is our last panel of the day. Uh, it's going to be moderated by Marcus Weisgerber of Defense One. Uh, this is our defense industry panel. Uh, we told a bunch of uh, defense companies, hey, we're, we're writing a report on uh, cruise missile defense. Would you like to send somebody over to, to help us think through how, uh, from a defense industry perspective, uh, uh, we as a country might tackle this? So, uh, Marcus, uh, over to you. Testing. Hello. There we go. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. Uh, I found the report by you and your colleagues incredibly interesting, and yes, I did read it. So, um, for all of you, uh, Tom and I have known each other about 10 years. We have the distinction of meeting each other by almost getting arrested together. I'll just leave that there. You could find out uh, what that was about afterward, perhaps. But it was at a defense conference, and there was no alcohol involved. Anyway, um, so I, I got very interested in cruise missile defense um, probably around 2015. I was at the um, uh, IDEX uh, trade show in Abu Dhabi, and I went to a briefing by the Russians, and they you know, talked about all these radars and cruise missiles and whatnot that they were developing. So naturally, my inclination as a journalist was to go talk to the United States uh, military and see what they were doing to counter it. And I was very surprised when I found out that not much was being done here in the United States, aside from a little bit of a patchwork of systems around Washington, so, which Tom and his team point out in the, in the report. So um, I th then also have the distinction, as I told uh, some of our guests yesterday, uh, by writing about cruise missile defense, I got to become famous on television because when the JLens broke free, they threw me on with Brian Williams on NBC News for an hour to talk about it. <laughs> so, because I, I was one of the only reporters writing about cruise missiles and cruise missile defense. Anyway, that uh, brings us to today. I was struck this morning by um, Lieutenant General Roper's comments. Uh, he referenced the c capabilities of the United States uh, for this type of uh, defense being, I believe he's used the term, outdated capabilities to protect the homeland. So, we're going to kind of unpack some of the stuff in the report and talk about what companies are doing to. Uh, address uh, cruise missile defense in the United States. So let me quickly introduce everybody. At the end, we have Doug Booth, Director of Radar and Integrated Air and Missile Defense at Lockheed Martin. Doug, thanks for joining us. Nick Bucci, uh, for, uh, Vice President of Defense Systems and Technologies at General Atomics. Jonathan Casey, Dir Dir uh, Director of Ground-Based uh, Air and Missile Defense at Raytheon Missiles and Defense. Dave McFarland, Senior Director of Miss, uh, missile defense programs at BAE Systems, and Michael Noble, Senior Director of Advanced Missions at Anderil Industries. So thank you everybody for joining us. I'm gonna pass it off to everybody. We're gonna go down the line, starting with Doug, and everyone's gonna give uh, some brief opening comments, and then we're gonna talk about the report. So Doug, over to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so Doug Booth, uh, 25 years at Lockheed Martin. Uh, my background has primarily been working in the Intel community and the DOD and some international work across primarily the space, electronic warfare, and the uh, radar and integrated air missile de uh, defense uh, domain. Uh, right now, my portfolio is across, uh, from a radar perspective and sensor perspective, across the space, air, maritime, and, and ground domain. Um, I think you've heard a lot about some of the systems uh, that are in my portfolio today that could be leveraged uh, as part of this solution. You've heard about the over-the-horizon radar uh, we currently manage uh, and have uh, people and personnel working over in Australia on that JORN capability. Uh, we've got airborne early warning with the APY-9 uh, radar that's uh, working in the Navy. Uh, Ground-based, uh, we just uh, started building the Air Force's uh, next generation long range uh, radar called 3Dealer. And then the Sentinel program, which you've heard about, we've just delivered five radars to the, uh, the first five radars for the Army. Uh, for the Sentinel program. Those are the tower-mounted uh, systems that you've been talking about. Uh, again, excited to be here. I think that, you know, I'm probably going to give some orthogonal thoughts later about the paper, but I, I do believe that it's not a matter of if, uh, but when that threat uh, comes into the homeland. Um, it's happening around the world, as was talked about, you know, the Aramco and, and with, uh, with Russia. And when you're talking about something that a threat that's traveling that fast, 500 plus miles uh, an hour, uh, that's subsonic, um, the ability to maneuver and evade our defenses, and we know that our adversaries are going to try and penetrate and do some reconnaissance uh, where our radars are today or our sensors are today. The ability to maneuver uh, is going to be very challenging for us to understand, and we have to make sure that we're looking out for that. Um, the 
ability to see a, a target that small when you're talking about the cross section uh, and flying at such a low altitude, you're going to be hard to tell the difference between the wave tops and the sea and the ocean and these cruise missiles flying real low. So uh, to me, it's a matter of, you know, what we need to get in there and a truly uh, layered in-depth uh, approach. Great. Thank you. Nick. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Tom and CSIS for uh, putting out this important report. Frankly, it, it's a long time coming, as, as Doug just said. Um, I guess I, I've been in the business for about 25 years in missile defense. Uh, i at a previous company, the one that Doug works for, and now at General Atomics for the last eight years. Um, t a very difficult problem, and I think the title of this, this uh, report says a lot. You know, North America is a region too. Yeah, the answer is yes, it is. It is a region too, and so what that does is it enables us to take advantage of all of the work that we've been doing for the last 40 years on this missile defense problem and all of the material solutions and the integration challenges that we've gotten through and kind of pull them together to tackle this problem. And I'm going to violate the uh, improv rule of saying yes and with but yes but. In this case, it is a region, yes, but it's a different region, right? It's the homeland. And so it requires a little bit more thought, you know, in terms of how do we do things with maybe a different set of criteria for resilience and preparedness and readiness and, and redundancy and things like that. How do we deal with things like consequence management, right? As I have to do environmental impact studies and all those things. So the shopping at Costco comment this morning deals with the, yes, it is a region. The, it's different, says, every now and then I got to go to the farmer's market. And, you know, I'll kind of take off from where uh, Stan Stafira said, because we have all this heritage, if you want to call it that, to leverage, I look at it from the detect, control, engage, assess sequence, if you want to call it that, right? And so we have a lot of capabilities in all those areas, but we need to add some, right? In detect, we have lots of RF sensors, we have lots of EOIR sensors, but what we need to do is kind of look at how do I use them a little bit differently? The paper talks about utilizing passive sensors. Well, that's a great opportunity with low environmental impact to get more data to solve this problem. In the engage side, you know, we have lots of active defense. We have lots of kinetic defense. How are we going to integrate things like high energy lasers or high power microwave weapons? How are we going to integrate pass more passive defenses too to solve this problem? From a control perspective, the homeland is large, expansive, and we got to operate in all domains. And so having things like very high speed assured Optical communications in all domains is going to be an important piece of the command and control part so I can get all the data from where it's collected all the way through to where it needs to be used. And then in the assess piece, it goes back to, to the detect in terms of looking and saying, how do I now piece together what's happened as this engagement's gone on? So I think it, it's important that we kind of look and say, where are some of the technologies that need to be moved in, right? Machine learning is huge. Autonomy is huge. How do we move those in as, as the report talks about into these phases? How can we move in these new technologies, i.e. going to the farmer's market and picking out that, you know, special crossbred zucchini <laughs> that we want to put in this recipe for, I'll call it the special reason that is the homeland. Great. Thank you. Jonathan. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to Tom, thanks to CSIS for, for having us and for putting out this much needed report. Um, you know, when we, when we talk about the cruise missile defense problem for the homeland, that there's a famous quote that strikes me. Um, you know, if we try to defend it all, we can def we'll defend nothing. And, you know, I think that really sums up the, the, the problem we have here. And I think that what, what Tom and the team did, putting out, uh, you know, the, the concept of defending the critical areas is really paramount to how we start to move forward here. And I, I think if you take that even a, a step further, and what we've done in some of the rapid development programs that we've done over the past couple of years, we, we've learned to do stuff fast. And one of the things that happens when we do stuff fast, we put something out there, you know, we build a little bit, and then we can learn a lot, and then we can build the rest. And I, I think that's really what we need to do here to be successful, is to get something out there and to start. Uh, you know, I, I th another 
point that uh, Tom and, and the team made in the paper is the idea of leveraging everything that's out there in the country already. All the different data feeds we have, all the, all the different radars that are out there, and it's, it's a great idea. The, the backbone to that is going to be how do we successfully collect the data and how do we know what to do with that data. And, and that's where I think the experimentation in the short term, you know, we can go out and we can pick a few of those FAA radars. We can take five or ten of them and, and we can, you know, set up a node and, and go test it and, and, go, and go try to go do that. And, and that's another thing that I think in the short term we can do to tar start taking that step forward and to start to learn so that we can then build even, even more beyond that. And the, the third point I'll, I'll make here is the, the architecture that we put forward has to be able to grow as the threat grows, right? And you know, I think that we focused the discussion on the, the counter, I'm sorry, on the cruise, missile, the cruise missile threat, but we've got to build an architecture that ev can evolve for the hypersonic threat and whatever's next after that. And you know, we talk about radars, that's certainly one area where we need to make sure we're, we're building radars with enough power that they can see smaller threats and you know, more, more stealthy threats. Uh, so the, the key is going to be to, to, to think, think, think three steps ahead uh, as we build this out. Great. Thank you. David. Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks, Tom, and, and thanks to CSIS for, for putting this together in this very important paper. And uh, in, in my little pitch here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk almost like a contrarian, but, but please don't get me wrong. I am totally behind this, and uh, I, I think it's a worthwhile effort. That having said that, you know, there, there are some things that we need to look at, as Jonathan just talked about, the scalability, flexibility of an architecture, the ability to grow to address uh, threats has to be there. There is some great technology that's just over the horizons in tech demo right now, for example, high, high altitude, long endurance UAVs. Uh, that could add to it. Uh, another technology that's out there that, that I've been playing around with is a hypervelocity gun weapon system. Bring guns into the kill chain for terminal defense. Um, you can do some great things there. You can increase your cost per kill. We talked about costs, uh, and that's an important piece. But I think, I think each of the panelists kind of identified uh, a, key, a key drawback to a bunch of, of the architecture that we're talking about here. And that's integration. Where's Colonel Barron's areas? Uh, he said it best. This, this is something that gets hand waved, and it's something that, quite frankly, the government goes over to you, industry, figure it out. Tell me how it works out. Well, it's difficult. It is extremely difficult. You know, my background. I'm an Aegis guy. I spent 30 years in the Navy. Uh, you know, staff and ships, commanding ships, working in the Pentagon. When we talk about integration, it's always out off the cuff and kind of the last thing we think about. And we're going to give that to, we're going to give that to industry. Well, I tell you, where, where's Jen? She wrote a report in March that we just got Patriot to talk to Thad and execute an engagement. That Juwan rolled through the Pentagon in 2015. Exhibit A. This is difficult. So when we, we look at this architecture, the complexity of this architecture, the complexity of the Guam architecture, how are we in industry going to address this? The good news is, is there are some tools out there. There are some processes out there that industry has been refining. And, and it comes down to digital engineering. For example, you know, three things. Uh, mission engineering, where you can do this with models. Model your mission, figure out what you want, link it back to requirements. You know, run it through the gamut. Of, of, uh, of different perturbations. You can sort through a bunch of different architectures pretty quickly with all the existing models that each that industry has. You know, as we look at this, these pieces, these capabilities are developed in stovepipes. You bring a, east, you know, a wedge tail. You bring a, a LTAMS radar. You bring something, but they're all developed their own, own little stovepipe. So when you put it in a system of system, and I'll, I'll poke at Tom a little bit. This is new. The systems aren't new that were developed in stovepipes. The weapon system, the architecture is new. Who's going to do all of that integration work? The second piece there, systems of systems, integration, and engineering, because that's a key part of this. 
Um, again, hard stuff. You know, we got models. Let's bring them into a digital environment. Let's run them through their traps. Let's trace them back to requirements. Let's validate them. Let's test them. Let's demonstrate them. We can do all these things. We know how to do that. But again, going back to an organization piece, you got to designate a program manager. Wow, we're having a tough time doing that. Who's running Guam Defense? Who's running uh, Homeland Cruise Missile Defense? I don't know. We're having a policy discussion about it. So before you can do all this Gucci stuff that we want to do, you know, we're going to have to address those policy issues, and we're going to have to come back to the integration pieces. And then finally, um, what data are you looking at? What do you, what do you want to get out of all this integration? You know, and, and do we ask ourselves hard questions about that? For example, if, if an LTAMS radar is part of the architecture, is that what's going to be needed to close the kill train for SM6? Is the data in the right format? Are we moving the data information transfer across this architecture, right? I, 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 go, I likened it to GMD, which moves data across 12, 13 time zones to close a kill chain. You know, we're talking about very, very difficult things here that, again, we're hand-waving, and we shouldn't hand-wave. We really need to do that next level of analysis and really chip in here. And, and again, I, I think that's industry's stated mission or implied mission. Thanks. Thank you, David. And actually, that's my first question that I'm going to have eventually after Michael speaks and gives his opening is going to be right to what you were just talking about with integration and stitching things together. But Michael, first, over to you. Well, well fantastic. So, uh, so Marcus uh, and CSIS and Tom, thanks so much for having me and Andrew here today. Um, we're a little bit different kind of company here. We're a, a private company. I've uh, been around for about five years. I'm three and a half months with the company, still learning it, so bear with me as I go here. Um, th I guess the, the thing I would offer, um, first and foremost, and couldn't agree more with my colleagues here, it's all about the integration. Um, so my background, I was uh, in the Air Force for 26 years as an acquisition officer and engineer doing development, first article sort of stuff, right? And the comments about we develop stovepipes, we develop great kit, but it's developed against a set of requirements for a specific set of tasks, and it's an afterthought about how are we going to pull all these things together. And it comes up in the report, it's come up in the panels before this, and it's coming up in this discussion, and I'm sure it will again. It's all about the integration. And so, frankly, the reason I'm at Andrel is uh, Andrel takes kind of a different approach to things. We're, we're not necessarily a hardware builder first. We do build some hardware, but we focus on the integration first. Um, and I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that throughout the day. Uh, I really appreciated the general's comments about agile development. Um, you know, what struck me looking through the report and having done ops analysis in the past, it's, it's a great body of work. I commend CSIS for the work, in particular the attention on a really hard problem. It needs it, it deserves it. But as all of you know, right, what we see in the field five years from now will be informed by this body of work, but it will not be the same as this architecture, right? We're gonna learn as we go. And that's been, you know, kind of a key ingredient for success in my experience in acquisition and development is, yeah, you know, if you spend a year, two years on requirements development and OAs and analyses of alternatives, you know, you're just not gonna keep pace with the threat. The threat's moving too fast. Our technology is moving too quickly. You gotta get out there and start, right? And realize that you're gonna have an imperfect solution and then continue to, to iterate. So it, it, requires, it requires industry, but it also requires partnership with the government. So the best programs are those where the government works very closely with industry. Each has an important role to play. They're unique, but it absolutely is a team sport. And you also need to include the warfighters early, right? So one of the challenges, you know, I found, I'm sure you, you guys have as well, is, you know, con ops, con emp is typically an afterthought, right? And so getting the warfighters in and ex meaningful experimentations, not stunts, but experiments that lead to, you know, discernible increments of capability is really, really critical. Um, so uh, I guess I'll leave it at that for now, and we'll look forward to getting into the discussion. Great, thanks. And as I told our panelists when we uh, 
I think I told him this when we chatted yesterday. Uh, I want this to be a conversation. So if somebody says something that you agree with, disagree with, want to add more to, feel free to interrupt. Uh, and I'll do so go for it. <laughs> just to kind of take off, I went up to Tom after the last panel and I said, just like the old military saying, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. It's great that CSIS put this report out and he's already talked about having an eighth principle. So absolutely agree, right? <laughs> there, this is required because it gets the conversation started, so. Yeah, and to, uh, and to continue, uh, before you get into the questioning, uh, we talked a lot about budgets, right? And going to Walmart, and uh, I wanted to uh, just kind of launch on that for a little bit, because when you hear Canada is putting aside a $40 billion budget uh, for theirs, and ours is about 32 right now. And we have a lot more, you know, larger land mass and population. I think that we need to look a little bit more in depth and, and get a little bit deeper in the layered approach and defense in depth. I think that there's some um, things that we could potentially look at. I think it's a great start by, by uh, Tom and, and the team. It's where we want to be. Um, but if you start with the, uh, the National Capital Region's IAD system as a place to start and look at the integration problems they've had just with that, I'm going to call it a simple system compared to what we're looking at now. And then building out from there, we're talking about more expenses. I think that there needs to be some more border surveillance. I think that the OTHR is, is probably not as reliable as we're, as we're kind of hand-waving a little bit, and we're going to need some space layer and probably some more airborne uh, early warning. We could probably make use of the MQ-9s that uh, we've done such a great job inventing. So I, I do think that we need to talk about more about the budget and start expanding that a little bit more to be some, some realistic, especially as we're giving a lot of funding to our um, overseas partners uh, right now. I think that we should be looking at protecting ourselves. I'm glad you brought up the NCRI ads. I was the program manager 15, 20 years ago. It's unreal to think it was that long ago, but it's a great example to my way of thinking of how this needs to be done, right? So we took ASRs uh, in the local area, integrated it with, um, with soldier radars and, um, and then stitched that together with cameras and the NASAMs, right? And it was like a year from initial idea to initial capability. And it has evolved since then, right? But it was just getting that initial capability, and in this case, getting the Army Guard involved, getting some experience and some reps with the system that really led to the traction for the capability that's there today. Yeah. I think, and, you know, that kind of builds on the comment I was making about, you know, Build a little, learn a lot, and then and then build a, build the rest, right? And I, I think you know we can we'll debate the budgets all all day. We'll debate the budgets all century, right? I, I, you know, so there's there's obviously you know we need to do a, a good job at at forecasting what we think it's going to cost, and and that informs some of the architecture. But I, I really you know you got to get something out there, and that's exactly what we did in the NCR you know 15 20 years ago, right? Is get something out there and and figure out how it's going to work. Yeah, that's. So that, that is a key point, but, you know, you got to operate it, too, and, you know, throw the NCR thing in there. I had a program that operated the NCR in Huntsville. Um, so, but we, we do have to approach this very thoughtfully, because if we, if we do do a budget grab, for example, what's in the MDA's budget right now, about $10 billion a year, $9 billion. You double that, there's going to be a lot of questions without a lot of data. So again, architecture analysis, let's model this, let's put it in a digital environment, let's find out what the architecture is going to be. Uh, you know, we're having a problem nailing down the architecture with Guam. I think the architecture was much more simple, well it is, for NCRI ads. However, you know, there is a path that shows us, that, that could show us a way. Uh, but the more we get it into a model, the more we run analysis, the better our budgets will, under, will withstand rigor and uh, we'll have the data to be able to present to those who, who mark those budgets. I guess I would argue the two aren't mutually exclusive. Um, I worked with the red team throughout my whole Air Force career and they've got a great process of doing really sophisticated modeling, ops analysis, and that, that introduces questions that they then go take to the field and experiment to answer those questions, which then informs the ops analysis. So it's, I think the two complement one another, and I think you need to run the two together. So to unpack what David was talking about earlier with in integrating, I know uh, Tom and I have talked for, for years about the need, and we've talked about this when we regionally in the Middle East for partners over there to just share what they have and the challenges of that. But as has been talked about here all day, you know, you have services that don't talk to each other, you have systems made by 
each company probably up here that don't talk to, or maybe not Andrew, but <laughs> that don't talk to one another. Um, so what in, what in each of your opinions uh, needs to be probably first and foremost uh, needs to happen in order to stitch every everything together. Uh, is it is it just is it bureaucracy? Is it technic? Is, is there something technically that needs to be done, or is it something else or a combination? Well, there's a combination. You know, first let's identify what we're talking about. We're talking about data. We're talking about proprietary data. Each stovepipe, each weapon system, again, you know, as platform kind of rises up to the platform. Uh, one of the business models we use in BAE Systems is be an agnostic platform integrator and deal with the data. And, you know, because these weapon systems are creating data. We talked about how we're going to move data around all over the place to close kill chains. So let's, let's approach it that way, you know. But that's going to require the government to really own a technical baseline and to provide the leadership on where we're going with that baseline. So yes, let's execute the trades, let's do the AOAs, all that kind of stuff. You can do it a little bit faster, better, cheaper with, with digital models. Uh, let's go in there and look at that. Let's snap the chalk line in an architecture that has growth, that, that's flexible and scalable. You know, all of these things that you could put together, you can model and you can, you can flesh out. But the government's gonna have to really identify, you know, and, you know, kind of protect or you know, address the data issues that each product provider or system of this system of system is gonna, gonna add. I'll stop. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's less technical and more on the policy and control of the data, especially when you start bringing in national uh, assets that might be a higher classification than, than some of the other uh, data that's coming off. I think the data itself, you know, can just be the zeros and ones from the threats and doesn't have to be so much the IP part of the, of the product itself. So, but I, I do think that it's less technical and we can probably get there faster um, if we just kind of free up some of the policy and, and uh, concerns between the different agencies and services. I think step one, we heard the general say, we're gonna hear about the ex uh, executive agent coming out soon. That's absolutely step one. Who is going to be responsible? What are they going to do to, to take on this mission and how will they execute it? I think the, one of the things we have to our advantage is we all are used to working with one another. And over the years, especially the last 15 or so, digital engineering and integrating models and those models being able to work in real time and communicate via internet protocol have helped us tackle some of the build a little, test a little, learn a lot things that Jonathan talked about, right? If I don't know exactly how I'm going to talk to somebody, the best way to do it is to talk to them and find out where we're not communicating and then fix it. So you kind of get through that cycle. And so those digital models are huge. Everyone is creating digital twins for everything. Getting those models to integrate, starting with, I'll say, very low fidelity models, all the way up to the highest fidelity models, and then hardware in the loop. Those are the kinds of things we have to get to. But job one is get who's responsible. You know, and I, I think there's, you know, there's a number of C2 systems out there that are in development. You know, there's a few of them. We, we all know what they are. And, you know, the goal is, is to kind of, I'll say, achieve a nirvana. But it's going to take a while to get there. You know, they're, they're not re largely not ready yet. Um, but there are things out there that we've used to, to do this type of thing before, right? The Navy's used the CEC system, the Air Force, we have BC3. Um, and so, in my mind, it's, we got to start. So, I, I go back to the comment I made earlier. Let's pick 10... 10 radars out there in the U.S. somewhere, and let's go make them all talk together, and let's, you know, let's pass that data to the NCR and, and see if we can get the systems to, to look at it. Um, How difficult is it to do that? Because, you know, I, I was trying to think about that as I was reading the report last night, and, you know, just driving down the highway, you run into weather radars, or if you're around Andrews, you run into stuff over there, yeah. too. Uh, you know, if you're in populated areas, like New York City, they're, they're around the airports. How difficult is it to actually, like, you know? I, I think it's going to be a case by case basis. I think some of the things you'll run into is some of these systems are not uh, set up currently to, to look at low altitude threats. They're going to throw those away. Um, and some of them may be not looking at, you know, small threats. Maybe they're only looking for big aircraft. So there is some work that we have to do to go, you know, make an update to these systems. And that's why I, I say let's start small, let's pick a few of them. 
um, and, and, go see, and, and go figure that out. I mean, it's going to be very much case by case. But, you know, I, to me, if you, if you take the integration problem in the whole, we'll, we'll, never, we'll never get there. We have to, you know, we have to localize it, and we have to use the systems that we have out there today to, to start and to experiment against it. Uh, we can't wait for those C2 systems that are trying to achieve nirvana, and that hopefully will, but just not there yet today. So I would offer the digital engineering stuff is really interesting, although I'll confess I'm from Missouri as far as that goes. We'll see if it solves the integration problem. And frankly, the, uh, the government just isn't that good at integration, and I, I don't want to be pejorative and knock the acquisition professionals I've had the good fortune to work with. It's just not a natural skill of the government. It's frankly better left to industry, and the incentives are all wrong for the most part, right? I mean, you guys build fantastic equipment, but the primary requirement, despite the KPI by which you're evaluated, is not how well it integrates with other stuff that's in the field or stuff that's in development. So you, you kind of have to leave it to industry to get this done, and you got to incentivize and partner with someone to do the integration. I, I think that's the only thing that we've seen work, and it hasn't worked that often, but that's the most promising thing I've seen. Yeah, I think that... Um you know, the integration of the systems, most of them are built on the same common platform, you know, like an asterisk system. But now you're talking about so much data, um, you know, into one system. If you just look at the volume of data from a simple, um, you know, Sentinel-based type radar, you're, you're, you're talking about, you know, limited uh, range and volume. If you start adding in an OTHR system and the volume there that goes from sea to atmosphere out thousands of miles, I mean, it's just so complex. You need some really, you know, high-end tools, data processing, social media type things that we see out on the internet today. I think that's where General Van Herk is saying he's going to unleash this on industry to help figure out. I think the data processing and signal processing side is going to be one of the biggest areas where we're going to need some help with on this. Yeah, I, you know, going back to that that piece because that's important. You know, we we call that information content analysis. You know, so so what are you doing with all this data? You know, is it in the right format? Are you moving it to the places you need to have it? You know, we, we again, we, we hand wave a lot of that stuff. We just assume it's going to be there like OTHR data. That's going to aid in closing a kill chain and, and you know, uh, creating a, a combined track. That, that's, that's easy to say, but it's very difficult to do. Now, you know, again, I guess I'm going to have to prove it to you. We have digital tools that can do that. We can model that information flow. We can analyze that data. We can ask those questions. Is it in the right format? Is it going to the right place? So, you know, we just got to get in there and just start doing it. One of the biggest challenges, I think, uh, when we heard it brought up, I believe, earlier today is combat identification. You know, how do you tell a flock of birds from a cruise missile or a Cessna or who knows what jetliner? Um, I guess what what needs to be done, um, but again, technically, uh, to actually improve this? To, is there anything any of your companies are working on that it could actually, uh, you know, imp improve that? And I think back to the the gyrocopter man who yeah. flew right onto the National Mall, and I, I don't remember the particulars of whether a radar saw it or not, or thought it was a bird or not. But um, what could be done to? prevent something like that from happening. So I, I was showing Ken Harmon, you know, a glimpse, and you can go on the internet and, and just Google, you know, air traffic across the United States today. And you can see the clusters of, you know, commercial airlines that are tracked. They're squawking a mode and code, you know. We know what those are, but they exist somewhere else. They exist in the FAA system. They exist in commercial sources. Again, we're talking data, we're talking big data analytics, we're talking algorithms that we can use to help us deconflict that airspace. But, you know, if, you know, a little about me. So I played around with tomahawks in my career, fired a couple of them. When I think about defense of the national capital region, boy, I can make a tomahawk kind of fly like a commercial airliner. I could probably get it to squawk a mode and code that looks like a commercial airliner. Oh, by the way, there's this nice mountain range called, you know, the, you know, right outside of DC that I can mask my approach and come in that way. Squawking a mode and code and looking all great. You can, I can get away with it one time at least, right? But that one time matters. 
And, and again, if we're not looking at that data, if we're not developing the TTP to, to deconflict airspace, to bring in FAA data, sort it out, you know, some AI ML to present our operators with, with methods to, to really see through all of this stuff, because there's a lot of stuff out there, then, then you know, we're not doing a, we're not really addressing uh, employment of the weapon system as we're talking about. Yeah, I, I agree, and um, you know, from just a basic system perspective, it's easy to identify a bird, you know, versus a cruise missile versus a type of a, a jet. I mean, that's that's done today. But if you think of some about a near peer threat to us, they're not going to just fly it that way. They're going to try to spoof our our systems, and that's that's the concern. That's also kind of where OTHR is helpful. It's different than other radars. Most radars just look up at the target, so it only sees like the the front end of the target come at you or the front end of the plane where OTHR signal comes down so you can see the whole side of the target so there's some algorithms that can be done there and modeling you know that can be done there to help identify using OT OTHR uh, as, as one of those. And again and from a machine learning thing there are characteristics of a tomahawk flying like a an airplane that it can't it can't possibly replicate an airplane because of its radar cross-section, let's say, right? So again, bringing all that information together before you make a decision so that you can make the right decision. You know, to, to your point, Jonathan, about how can we understand how these radars can talk? Well, the, the NRO is, is buying commercial data, SAR data, off of satellites. They're gonna take that raw data and go process it and come up with their own products. Well, some of the things that we don't get out of those air traffic radars and those weather radars are things like they don't see targets below a certain amount probably because they're not allowed to or whatever the answer is. If I get the raw data, now I can go process it in a different way and start pulling together that information to go do this. So the data can be there, it's just a matter of how do I pull it all together, do it smartly, and get the, the information that I want. There is a question I want to uh, hit from the audience because it, 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 uh, it ties into this and in combat identification and it talks about the um, number of, uh, the, the Pentagon's talked about UAPs a lot of late and there's been a lot of attention paid to that on Capitol Hill. Um, but it says what, what tech can be brought to bear, tech, tech can be brought to bear to better understand the issues that, the issues and uh, can capabilities being used in cruise missile defense help with identification in that aspect? Well, I think one of the things I, I tried to mention earlier, um, having multi-spectral sensors helps a lot because now I can maybe something that is designed to spoof one particular sensor can't spoof another. And so if I can ensure detection from, say, an EOIR sensor or an RF sensor, now I can start picturing, pulling that picture together better and getting better characteristics because I've looked at it different ways. Using passive sensors is another great way um, to, to get different information. Hey, why don't we talk about acoustic sensors? I, I know the big thing that looked like uh, binoculars that was in the report. Um, there are a lot of really good acoustic sensors out there which we happen to make one that has been used for cruise missile defense, counter UAS. Those are important sensors to now bring into this architecture so that you can get that, I'll say, broader picture of the characteristics of a particular threat or object so you can tell whether it's a threat to be sure you're going after the right thing. And that's when your costs start to, to go up that we talked about before. Since it's multi-spectral and it's multi-static. The, abil the ability to use a ground radar with an airborne radar is going to help with that identification as well. So I think there's multiple things that can be done there uh, to help with the solve the problem. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. So, so I was just going to say it's, it's always going to be a difficult problem that, that we're going to have. You know, one of the things that I, I think I read in, in the report was the idea of, you know, a I'll say a, you know, a, a different states. Of, of alert. So when there's a very, very high level of alert, do you reduce the level of confirmation you need uh, in terms of combat ID? And, you know, I, I think that's a difficult decision, but, and I really just wanted to pose it for the, you know, to see what everybody else thinks of that. Um, <clears throat> it would have been a good question probably for the government panelists, but uh, I didn't think of, it, think of asking it at that time. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's never, you're never, with these methods we're talking about, other than getting eyes on a target, it's never going to be 
Um, I mean, that's the 100 percent way to do it. And every, you know, but the technology. I mean, it's it's really that data analytics. It's, it's the things that the social media companies are using to find bots, and it's looking for the abnormalities abnormalities in the data set that, that tells you it's it's something that's different than the rest. Um, but I, I am interested in what everybody thinks of the idea of of having different alert states and, and changing the requirement on combat ID. Well, you know, that, that, does, that does happen. You know, that's part of TTP for, for some of the air defense stuff uh, that the services are doing now. You know, and you, you are going to see some precursors uh, to, you know, a potential strike. Uh, are you going to see them all? No. But, you know, this goes to what, the, what Colonel Behrens was talking about, playing away games that we're really good at. Uh, big data analytics from NRO to, to look and see count submarines like we used to do in the old days. How many Oscars are in port? Hmm, there's one missing. I wonder where it is. Well, let's get some ASW aircraft out there to find it, right, before it becomes an air defense problem, make it an ASW problem. So we got to start thinking big. We got to start thinking uh, uh, the ba about the battle space differently. It's now the homeland, which means everything else. You know, we have to be out there with our four deployed forces with the mindset that we are defending the homeland out there. So COCOMs have to talk to each other. We have to enable that. Staffs have to talk to each other. We have to enable that. Their machines have to talk to each other. We have to enable that. We have to flow information. Oh, boy, it all comes back down to data. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we have so much good ISR. We have fantastic radar. We have fantastic EO awesome SIGINT, et cetera. It will continue to approve it, and we need more sensors, absolutely. But I think a key thing to realize here is this is not something we solve, right? The enemy has a vote here, too. The way we do combat ID is going to vary from one target to another, and they're going to adjust, right? And we're going to take advantage of new technologies. And one of the things I thought was really good in the report is the recognition that this architecture is going to have to evolve, right? Hopefully in a few years we'll have overheads like HPTSS and tracking layer and so forth that'll be part of that architecture. And you're going to have to have a framework, and again, it's the integration piece, right? And it's the process that's able to adapt to the changes from, from the threat and the changes in our technology. And, and I think, you know, you talked about HPTSS and, and the tracking layer from SDA, very important capabilities. We'll get there eventually. And kind of to your point, Jonathan, what do we do in the meantime as we start to see indications and warning? Well, persistence is what we need, right? You don't have persistence until you get that fully populated constellation of satellites that gives you 24-7, 365 heads up um, data. In the meantime, you have surge capabilities. You put out medium altitude, high altitude, long endurance, UAVs with the right sensor suites on them to be able to surge to where indications and warning have given you some level of information that says, you know what, I, I now have a rogue submarine off the coast of the east, off the east coast. I'm going to set up a picket for the next 30 days, 60 days. And that becomes part of your architecture to get that surge capability as you move into the various stages as indications and warning kind of take you to those stages. Yeah, Tom, that was a note to the team as well, because I didn't see anything undersea from a sensor perspective that probably needs to be looked at as well. So, yeah. so Michael, I believe, so Andrew's, I believe, is that you guys have been testing radars on towers. So can you talk to us a little bit about what you learned. I have a question for Tom because I don't see Wes in the room anymore. Did you guys look at how much it would cost in your report to actually rent the tower space to put radars on? Okay. Over to you, Michael. Sure, so uh, yeah, the radars on towers is a great example of kind of the iterative uh, development process. Uh, so our counter intrusion system is probably one of our marquee systems. Um, our big contract, if you Google Andrel, is uh, we're the system integration partner for SOCOM. And frankly, I think that's a good template to follow for this type of stuff where, you know, SOCOM had a number of events with industry involved, with problems that were presented, and it was a matter of, okay, how do you integrate existing systems or systems that you're developing or you're partnering with to address that problem? And through that, the course of multiple events, you know, they determined, hey, 
here's, a, here's an industry partner that we want to work with. Uh, they're going to work with other industry partners for elements of that architecture, which is going to be continually evolving. And the radars on towers is just one piece of that. And the way we arrived at that was, uh, you know, just based on the need for, you know, tracking, in this case, human beings at the border, um, the cameras were insufficient. So to get additional range, you needed the radars. Uh, to get the combat ID, you need to stitch the radars with the cameras. And then the real power of the system isn't any of the given radars because they're just commercial. Likewise, the cameras, it's the stitching together of the network. And that's, and that, it's that I word that keeps coming up over and over again. And um, yeah. David, you talked earlier about um, hypervelocity hyper guns. Um, I don't believe that was in the report either, but can you talk about how something like that would be employed? Is it, would, it, would, be, would these be like coastline well, uh, defenses? Yeah, or? take Guam. Uh, the Air Force is looking at this, and they're making a significant investment in it for air, ba air, air base defense. Right at the north tip of Guam is this little place called Anderson Air Force Base. Uh, you know, kind of an important place. Uh, you probably want to put in a close-in weapon system to, to, you know, enhance your layers. Right? We're talking about uh, layering both sensors and, and effectors, missiles. You know, boy, you, if you want to clean up leakers... Use a gun. Uh, we've proven what SeaWiz can do, and it's smaller caliber, right? 20 millimeter versus 155. Um, but we've tested this. BA Systems have been working this. It's kind of an offshoot of when uh, Railgun was canceled. You know, those hypervelocity projectiles are there, and in fact, they're even developed even further. Uh, right now, we've been conducting tests on, on firing these uh, pretty rapidly. And put them in a battery. You know, you know. Somebody said Nike Hercules earlier, and I was thinking about coastal artillery. And uh, if you if you integrate that, you can pick up a lot of leakers cheaply with a gun. And uh, you know, but to Tom's point, you can't put them everywhere, right? They're terminal defense systems, but you can put them where you need them to count, and you can't afford to have leakers. So, you know, it's. Uh, some good work our, our engineers have been working on is that hypervelocity gun weapon. It's a guided round, oh, by the yeah, way. That, that I was going to add that if you yeah. didn't, David. I mean, yeah. the big difference between CWIS and what you're talking about is precision guided munition to be able to take out that's, reasonably sophisticated threats that can yeah, maneuver because it that's can That's what maneuver. it is. So that's an important piece is that precision guided munition piece because that's what gets you the, the kill advantage to take them out. And frankly, it gets you the, the cost advantage because they're a hell of a lot cheaper than missiles are, both the inbound and outbound defensive missiles. Yeah, if you did a cost for kill analysis and compared it to an MSC versus, you know, we employed, we shot two rounds at a cruise missile, knocked it down, that's an order of magnitude difference. That was about 300K. MSC is going to cost you a cost per kill. You're in the millions easy. So it, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty compelling. Nick, I wanted to go to you. I have another platform-specific question. The Reaper was alluded to earlier. We've, you know, it's been, been used a ton over the last two decades, uh, Predators and Reapers. Um, we now are at a point where we see the Air Force want to unload 100 of them to uh, another part of the government. Um, have you guys looked at how a Reaper could be used in, in the, you know, cruise missile, specifically, uh, kill chain? We, we have. Um, we've looked at it from a couple of different perspectives, protecting the platform itself as well as protecting critical assets. And so, you know, armed with the right sensors, armed with the right interceptors, the right missiles, it, it certainly can provide that level of capability. Um, the, the key with those is, you know, unmanned, long endurance. You know, depending on the loadout, somewhere between 36 and greater than 48 hours you can have a single aircraft up doing surveillance and doing uh, protection. So that's really the key is getting that long surveillance and, and frankly being able to stay up that long, no manned aircraft can do that because pilots can't take it, at least not easily. They got to get refueled much more often and things like that. So the, the real key to utilizing things like unmanned aircraft is the ability to be there on station when required, surge as needed, taking, you know, the, one of the things in the report was don't throw away anything. Right. The reference was don't throw away the data from the, the ARSRs and the ASR radars. 
but I also looked at it as um, don't get rid of assets that still have intrinsic value, right? And, and some will say, well, you have to do this and you have to do that. Well, I worked on a system that was designed to do air defense. And all of a sudden, after you know three years, we had ballistic missile defense capability. And someone asked, well, how the heck did you get that done? And, and so we created a briefing called Blood from a Stone. Sometimes you can get more out of a system that was built to do something, to do something completely else, because you thought about it a little differently. I mean, SCO has been doing that for a while now. You know, added capabilities to SM6, added capabilities to, to other programs. So um, we can't necessarily say, we shouldn't use this particular asset because it can't do. Well, it might be able to do if you put a little bit of thought into it and, and try it. So. Yeah, and I, I think some of the, uh, the payloads that we've been looking at putting on the MQ-9 is, is going to help get eyes on the target as well. So if you can do airborne early warning pods, you know, with the imagery capability that already exists on the MQ-9, I think that's what the decision makers really need um, before they figure out what they're going to, what, what they want to do. So I think that's what's real key is some lightweight uh, payloads that allow them to really fly that 24 to 36 hours. That's really going to extend the range of your, of your surveillance network. Sensing as well as, I'll yeah. call it, other types of weapons, not just kinetic weapons, but high energy lasers, high power microwave, et cetera. You know, just over the horizon or in, in the hill, the high altitude, long endurance UAV kind of market are, you know, solar powered hails. Uh, we've been testing one. Uh, Airbus is flying one right now. It's been flying for a couple of weeks. Uh, they're, you know, it's part of a, a OSD's initiative to operationalize the stratosphere. You know, we talked about balloons carrying big, heavy payloads. We talk about UAVs up there that, that can carry very light payloads, almost, you know, LEO-type payloads into the stratosphere with solar-powered aircraft. So th those things are there, and they're, you know, in development. They can help us out with a lot of this. Um, we don't want to foreclose any, you know, avenue that, that's going to improve the kill chain. But one of the things I uh, mentioned to Tom a, a month or so ago was I look at our uh, UAV platforms as suborbital geostationary satellites. Yes. Because they stay over a particular place and provide you the kind of data that you get from a satellite, a little bit more up close and personal, not quite as far uh, and broad, but they essentially act like a geostationary satellite at lower altitude. So. I was just going to offer, there, there's lots of great sensor and platform technology that exists today and that's on the horizon. I think one of the challenges, I don't recall if it comes up directly in the report or is implied, is cost imposition, right? So part of this is, I mean, obviously we need to protect the homeland, but how do you not only deter but create an environment where it's just not fiscally sound, if you will, for an adversary to try to threaten us with cruise missiles or other other types of, uh, types of weapons. And so I think throughout all this, when you're thinking of the architecture, and it's going to be dynamic, you have to think about the cost piece. And that's hard, right? It's hard to set requirements up front for here's what the architecture is and what the cost bogey ought to be. And we all know, right, you know, budgets, you know, next year is semi-real, everything beyond that is kind of make-believe and it's going to change, et cetera, right? So it's a really difficult problem. So. You know, one way to approach that is, you know, challenge industry. Hey, you guys put skin in the game. You guys solve this. Present us something that works and do it as cost effectively as possible because it's in your best interest, just like commercial works, right, um, to present a solution that satisfies the need, not necessarily the requirements, but the mission need, you know, at the most cost effective uh, price point as possible because that's, that's revenue that, you know, if, if if it's more expensive, it's revenue you're going to lose, it's profit you're going to lose. And that's kind of the way we operate. I, I, just two things that, that come to mind. You know, the first is obviously when we, when we talk about being able to get that early warning and, and do it in a way that has, you know, I'll say a lower life cycle cost, right? We have to look at not just the acquisition cost, but the, the life cycle cost. And I'm thinking about the operations and, and, and I'm thinking about the power consumption and these lightweight, you know, airborne vehicles that, you know, we can fly from somewhere else or, or really good at that. Uh, the place they're going to lack, though, and, and we're not, is that they're, you know, we're not, we don't have enough power there to be able to provide the, the level of attract that we need to engage the targets. So, 
you know, I, I think the early warning gives us decision time and it, and it lets us know sooner. It also helps us with a, with a response, which is that um, <clears throat> obviously key to the deterrence piece of it. Uh, but we're still going to need that engagement quality data that's going to really only come from that, those local sensors uh, that, <clears throat> that we're going to need. It's going to be very hard to get, ever get away from that. So earlier today, uh, General Murray talked about um, the government kind of wanting to take a software-like approach to developing capabilities. So I want to turn that question around back to you guys. And we've talked a lot about cultural, cultural uh, um, bureaucratic issues. Um, I wanted to talk about cultural changes within industry. We talked about systems not being able to talk, talk, um, to, talk to one another. Uh, what, are, what have been your observations from within your own companies about you know, the, the, the um, turning, over turning over data to the government and the government owning the baseline? How's that, how's that being received or is it, you know, I know there's historically been a stiff opposition to this, is, is that changing? I think it is. In our company, that's our business model. The government bought it. It's theirs. Um, we just have to enable them. That's why our focus is on the tools to help enable them. The model-based systems engineering, the digital engineering tools, the integration tools, that type of approach. Because uh, more and more, as that culture changes where the government becomes a lead system integrator, they become, um, you know, they have to get smarter on what they're doing in their own technical baselines. If, if you're gonna sustain them, to Jonathan's point, which is a key point, and, and spiral them and, and modernize them and all that type of stuff, they really do have to own their baselines. If you're gonna prevent vendor lock, if you will, um, it, it's, they have to step up to the plate to do that. So their culture changes. One, they're gonna have to own it. Two, they're gonna have to train their workforce to understand what they're looking at. And three, demand that industry, you know, knock down some of those, those data rights that, that sharing that, that's preventing a bunch of this true integration. Because, you know, as everyone's talked about it up here, even the industry panel, integration comes from cooperation from human beings. We have to be able to do that. We have to be able to trust each other that, that radar data that's coming from a Lockheed Martin OT, you know, OTH radar that's going into one of Jonathan's radars or, or we're bringing that together in a system composite track that everybody's interests are protected. We have digital tools that can do that. So, you know, that's kind of where we're pointing industry is, is down that direction. I, I think it's, it's an interesting, I'll, I'll say there's a conundrum right now because on, on one side, all the new development programs that we've seen come out over the last few years, the, the mantra has been, we want your skin in the game. We want you to demonstrate. We want you to invest. And, and bring what you have, and you know, we saw this on, on LTAM is a great example of it, um, which, which Raytheon won, right? And you know, that goes in the face of give me your baseline if I'm investing all this money. Uh, so you know, I think we've come a little ways, you know, things like royalties and, and things like that that the government's you know, starting to accept um, because we need a way to make back the ROI if we're gonna make that investment, right? I mean, that, that's just the bottom line. So you know, I think with going faster and with, with bringing capability before <clears throat> bringing capability to the to the to the competition needs to come that evolution in, in, in how we incentivize and, and provide that return on investment. I think sometimes it's not the data that you're sharing amongst the sensors that has the proprietary, if you want to call it that information, and it's how I got to that data. And so sharing information is easy. You know, sharing how you get to some of that data is where sometimes, you know, that's where the, the really smart folks that work at all of our companies, that's where they put their livelihoods into it. And frankly, you know, uh, I think it was uh, David said, the government paid for it. So in general, when the government pays for it, the government owns it. And they can use it as, as they see fit. When it's developed on discretionary funds, that becomes where, you know, we start to have those tough discussions, and they're, they're always hard discussions, but we always get through them because we always figure out a way how to you know, protect each other's equities, if you want to call it that, so that the warfighter still gets what they need and the company still has made a contribution to the warfighter going forward. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think um, you know, our business model is 
uh, we invest our own, it's commercial, right? So we invest our own money to develop a product and bring it back and sell it to the government as a proven product, right? And uh, we've had those discussions about, um, you know, owning the baseline. And the government needs to own what they bought, but, you know, when they develop stuff um, on like a, a traditional development contract, uh, you know, it's, there's only so much they can do with it, right? So I think the government needs to think about what do we really want out of owning this? So the commercial model is nice in that, you know, they get what they want, they get what they need to train their war fighters, to operate a system and field a system, but, you know, they're not trying to take the place that naturally is best um, occupied by industry. I almost hate to say these two words, but open architecture helps in some of that, right? Because <laughs> if we have the right interfaces def defined and the right capabilities defined for all of those things that have to come together, they can come together without having those battles all of the time. And it helps, you know, because now everybody can bring their unique capabilities to the table and bring it together. And, and you don't have to have those battles in a lot of ways. Well, we could have a whole long conversation yeah, on that. That's why I said I almost hated UCI to bring it up. And the, the company um, specific versions of the common abstraction layer that are fielded, et cetera, and things like stitches that are intended to bridge all those disparate uh, cows. So the challenge there is, that, I mean, it sounds great in principle. It's really hard in practice, or at least yeah. it has been hard in practice. I think, um, you know, things like stitches are encouraging, but incentivizing an integrator who doesn't necessarily have skin in the game for any of the hardware elements per se, but is responsible for developing a system that works, there's some, there's some precedent for that actually, you know, working in practice. Well, well there is, and, and, uh, and there is a movement towards that. Take missile defense and uh, GMD futures uh, for ground-based mid-course defense. Uh, the missile defense agencies made a made a decision to go away from a, a prime prime provider. Uh, they broke up the contract when before they just had one belly button. Hey, make this change to the weapon system, make this change to the interceptor. They just went to the prime to do that. Now they have to go through several contractors to do that, with one capstone kind of contractor being the technical agent for that. So. It's, it's a culture change. It's, it's something that we're going to do differently. But really, when you look at it, yes, it does create seams, but it also puts the, product, the, the stovepipe product providers, and I don't say that in a derogatory way, you know, they're focusing on delivering a product, an interceptor, you know, and phased array, uh, IDT, you know, that type of stuff, that type of component in the weapon system, well, they can focus on doing that. Somebody else can focus on the integration, an independent integrator that supports the government. So, you know, that's kind of what I'm seeing emerging from a lot of this stuff. So something that I've been writing about a lot, this is more broadly to the industry, but I, it affects pro everything that you, got, you guys do, is the kind of the workforce issues right now and the supply chain issues right now. And I was wondering, is there anything, um, I, I, I understand um, for missile defense, it's different than building a ship, where I know there's been a lot of issues with uh, trades workers and stuff, but are there any unique areas right now where you're um, experiencing uh, you know, heartburn, if you will, uh, due to both workforce and um, supply chain? Yes. <laughs> I live in a town named Huntsville, Alabama, where <laughs> we're, we're, we're in space programs, we're in missile defense, we're even in ground-based uh, strategic deterrence, we're even in uh, Trident D5 integration. If you're an engineer, <laughs> you're gonna be a wealthy person. Um, they're in high demand and they're hard to come by. And they're always working for somebody. And, and this is something where, you know, you. We, we struggle with this. We go to different parts of the country to recruit, to bring them to Huntsville. We, we do some innovative things, and, and I, still, I still feel in, in some of the programs I've overseen that I'm losing traction. Uh, because guess what? My, my friends are also doing the same thing for the same kind of talent. And, uh, and it's, it's very difficult. To, to specific disciplines, you know, system engineers, particularly model-based systems engineers, you know, bringing, bringing that together and using models instead of, like I did, you know, I'm a nuclear engineer, graduated in 1989. 
Have I done engineering since? No, right? Do I even know what a model-based systems engineer looks like? No, right? There's, there's that challenge that we're trying to, to, to find and, and recruit that kind of talent. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult and it's real. Um, I think, you know, the combination of the Top Gun movie and Tom's report hopefully will get some excitement <laughs> around the world and we, we need some more engineers to come in and help us with the problem. Uh, I completely agree. The other is on the, on the supply chain side. If we can yeah. develop some microelectronics here inside of the U.S. and, and take some of the uh, pressure off of the, what we're trying to get internationally, I think that's a major uh, problem that we have right now. I think it was a double whammy. You know, everybody heard about the great resignation, right, over the last two years. There was also the great retirement. There were a lot of people who said, I'm out and have retired. And that comes with a double whammy because not only do they take and you lose that person, but you lose all the knowledge that they had as well, which now says all of the new folks that you have to bring in because the other folks resigned or retired, you don't have anybody to bring them up to speed on your problem. So it really has been a, a very difficult time for, I think, every industry. I mean, I don't know if anybody's flown in the last two months, but it's pretty brutal out there, you know? Half the time you're lucky if you get to your destination, period, let alone on time, so. Yeah, so I guess a couple of thoughts. So supply chain, absolutely, it's a big deal. Couldn't agree more. We need a U.S. foundry. We need a U.S. supply of semiconductors. It's a strategic issue. We got to fix that. From a workforce standpoint, so we're a little unique. We're a software-first company. 70% uh, of our workforce are engineers, and a lion's share of them are software engineers. And I'm sure you guys are suffering the same thing. They're really, really hard to come by, right? Uh, so there's an undersupply in general. Um, a lot of them want to go work for the Amazons and the Googles, et cetera. That said, we found that, uh, I mean, the, the this generation is very patriotic. If given the opportunity to do cool software work in support of national security, we're seeing a lot of folks who are attracted to it. One of the big challenges I guess I would turn on the government folks is we just don't have a good process for acquiring and valuing software, right? So the, the integration approach um, that we've talked about throughout this is one way to do that, right? Put a mission system integrator that's a you know, software-centric company uh, to pull everything together because integration data work is fundamentally software driven. Um, but that can't be the only approach, right? Others are bringing software to the field through hardware by necessity, right? But we've had, you know, multiple customers who have said, hey, I'd like to put your software on your competitor's hardware and vice versa. And I think we're all for it. We just can't find a business model that closes to make that make sense. So, you know, that's a shared problem. Um, the impact on our ability to recruit engineers is probably secondary, but it's, it's probably worth noting. So we have about five minutes left. Last question for everyone. We'll give everyone this last one. Uh, if, if there was one thing, uh, what's one thing that wasn't in Tom's report, Tom and his team's report, that uh, if you were writing the report that you would put in? You give you a minute to think about it. I see a smirk, Nick. I see a smirk. I'll jump on that first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the systems of systems approach. <laughs> the systems of systems approach. We cannot, we, we cannot, you know, we, we did talk about the architecture, but we, we talked about it, you know, at a very high level. The system of system approach, the system of system analysis that, that has to be done to, to look at the different, you know, combinations of weapon systems within the system is, is really a difficult thing. And it goes back to the I word that we've been discussing and, and we all recognize it's difficult. We, we can't undersell that. And uh, you know, integration deals with the dot mill and MFP stuff that we, we've talked about. You have to organize, uh, organize around it. You need somebody that's gonna do this, a lead agency, which we talked about. Uh, we, we talked about different acquisition processes that we could use to bring to bear from this. Agile, you know, DevSecOps now. Uh, and we talked about policy. But, you know, we, we have to work the whole system to include the people, to include the processes, and then, of course, the technology and, the, and our model-based tools that could really help us and bring this to bear. 
I think I kind of addressed it at the very beginning, but um, you know, uh, Wes talked a lot about going to Costco. Mm -hmm. If there was one thing I wish they would have talked more about was going to the farmer's market for some of those technologies that maybe aren't there right now. They're not on the shelves at Costco, but they are at the farmer's market. And maybe going digging a little bit deeper to, to figure out how to get them, how to acquire them, and how to get them integrated, I think that would be the one add. You know, I think the report was pretty thorough. The one thing that uh, comes to mind for me is more on the operation side. How do we actually go execute this? What does that look like? Where do we put the ops centers? How do we put redundancy in place? And, and how do we connect everything um, in, in a in a you know in that <clears throat> in that way? And you know, we talked a little bit about C2. We talked about the Nirvana systems that are out there. What can we do in the next two years, the next three years, the next five years before those Nirvana systems are out there? And how does that all play together with the operations piece? Is I, I think what as we move forward here and as we select that, you know, that <clears throat> select that uh, that lead agency or lead department, you know, I think that's one of the key things that's going to come out when they start talking to the warfighter. Yeah, I think uh, you know, on top of some of the other you know, tactical uh, sensors we thought would make it a little bit more defense in depth. I think like a day in the life of what would change uh, for the Army and Air National Guard that are running the NCRs. And you're talking about, you know, eight to 10 priority sites. You know, so you're talking about eight to 10 of those units and Major General Rice is pretty busy, uh, you know, today. So I think that understanding that is, is really gonna be helpful to, to inform the, the services. So, so I drove my feet to go last, so it's, I'll confess I haven't had an opportunity to read the report. It's on my nightstand, and I'll get to it tonight, but I um, wanted to leverage your guys' answers. Um, yeah, I think you hit on a lot of great points, and the thing that resonated with me is the whole Agile development. I think General Murray brought that up. Um, that's just going to be so critical through this, right? I mean, and the recognition that regardless what architecture you lay out, it's going to be different because technology keeps moving and because the threat keeps moving. All right. Well, I, I think we are out of time. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. And thank you to CSIS and back over to Tom. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, thanks for everybody that came out today. Uh, first of all, I just love that you guys are throwing darts at it. Uh, that's fantastic. That tells me that, uh, that the, the thinking is happening uh, and that you know we wouldn't have so many big brains out here, wouldn't have so many uh, officials out here today. Uh, if this, this wasn't a pressing concern. So thanks for that. Uh, I also want to uh, call out two people. Uh, first of all, Co Tony Behrens uh, and also Nick Bucci because they both recurred to, to kind of historical things. Uh, Colonel Behrens talked about uh, Nike Hercules, which was a, a very distributed uh, uh, architecture. And that holds some lessons here. And, and Nick, you called out our, our passive uh, acoustic sensors in the report. We have an unwritten rule of always having a an old historical throwback kind of pictures here. So there's lots of lessons to be learned from the past. Uh, and uh, this is a fundamentally an air defense problem. It's an air defense problem that's, uh, that's come, home, uh, come home to roost here. So thanks, everybody. I also want to thank Sean Shake for really putting all this together. There's a lot of work. Please give him a hand. And uh, <laughs> and uh, please stay tuned. We'll have some more things coming out in the next couple months. Appreciate it, guys.